We got too short in the building. Welcome back to Black TV, West Coast legend. Been dropping hit records for decades. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like um, I feel like uh, now's a good time to you know pop my collar a little bit. I'm getting ready to drop a new album. You know, hip hop has all these boundaries of age and where you're from and who you with. And I'm just like, I'm always been a, a, a champion of hip hop doing what the fuck it wants to do. So I'm, I'm in that space right now where I'm hip hop doing what the fuck I want to do. Hell yeah. I feel you know? like you've always been in that space. So, well, you know, I'm, I'm talking age wise mostly. Okay. Like to be my age and to, and to still be hungry and doing the best you could do and jumping on planes, doing shows and, you right. know, in the studio every other day. I'm, Facts. I'm, I'm, that shit, that part. Facts. Speaking of, your studio is beautiful. Thank you. Like, yeah, it's just a vibe. Yeah, you know, this is um, this is my latest, greatest, you know, facility. But I've been doing this since I was a youngster. I've, I had dope spots in Oakland um, on two different occasions. Atlanta, two different locations. You know what I'm saying? And, and L.A., two different locations. This is my second location in L.A. Are they as big as this, though? This is the biggest facility I've gonna... ever had only because I just came across this huge building. Okay. But we don't need this much space, and <laughs> I could have did something that feels just like this in a much smaller space. But, yeah, this has been the biggest one. But they all, like, um, I would say that the studios here are really good, but they're not better than the studios I had when I was in Atlanta. Like, mm. like you know, but at the same time, this is more of a digital age. For sure. And... I got all the best digital shit you could want. I mean, everything. Every, this is this is not something that you just move into and you just hook it up. This right. is something that literally uh, I got the building in 2015. I did some stuff to it. Next year, 2016, we did some more stuff. And every year we kind of like added. And we were really literally, this building is so big, we are literally just building one room at a time. And the reason why I did it like that was because I wanted the building to have a certain character that you couldn't get if you built it all at the same time. Because if you built it all at the same time, it would have that vibe. Right. So if you waited six months, do another section, finish it, wait six months, do another section. And sometimes it was like different little crews coming in, <laughs> different artists coming in. And it just, get, it, when you walk through the building, the entire building, it's like a two short museum. Right. And my, my inspiration, which I don't think I came anywhere near it, not even trying to, but my inspiration is, uh, Paisley Park Prince and okay. just how he would have a place for his friends to come to and enjoy his, you know, invitation and come into his world and stuff. So that's, that's what the vibe is. For sure. Does it, I mean, is it like exclusive only? Yeah, no, people all the time come and say, how much for studio time, man? And I want to come down and use you. I'm like, nope, this is like my house. It's right. Not, there ain't no hourly rate or right. can't book nothing. <laughs> and if I do let you use it, it's because you're my homie and I let you use it. That's Facts. the only way you can use it. Facts. I know you said the Mickey shirt was intentional. Can you explain that? Well, I'm a father now. Oh, that's why? <laughs> and I, I actually recently went to Disneyland oh. with my daughter. And I didn't wear this shirt or anything, but I'm just, that's the vibe I'm kicking off right now. Is not. I didn't want to really talk about it, but. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. I was just wondering. But at the same time, um, yeah. the shirt was intentional. I'm like, too short to talk about that pimp shit, bitch shit. And I say, look too short with a Mickey Mouse shirt on. I it's love cool. it. I love it. Okay, well, 35 years ago, 18, 1987, you dropped Born to Mac album. Mm -hmm. Signed a major deal with Jive Records. Um, just talk about that era. And obviously, you're celebrating the anniversary this year. But, yeah. Well, you know, I, I had, when I signed the Jive Records, I was probably eight years into being a rapper. Like from um from probably I don't know, I was like like fourteen, fifteen when I really got rolling. And then when I signed a jive, I might have been like twenty one, twenty two, twenty one, somewhere in there, nineteen eighty-eight. Um in eighty seven, when I made my third album, the the, the my fourth album, the first three had been like underground albums on a label called 70, a label that was called 75 Girls Records. And it was owned by a dude named Dean Hodges. He's from Acorn Projects in West Oakland. Dean was a well-known street hustler who did good. And he was like, you know, upper echelon in the hustling world. And he wasn't the kind of guy who was loud and wild or, or the kind of person who um, was in the streets a lot. He just handed, 
he handled his business and was in his own world. So through his little brother, I got plugged with Dean. And Dean was, he wasn't just trying to do hip hop. He was just trying to be in the music industry as a label. He, had to, he wanted to be a label. So he brought all these people around, musicians, singers. He had me in the house. And, you know, we had engineers and all kind of, you know, just it was a professional setup. Everybody had came from somewhere where they were really good at what they were doing. Right. I had been rapping at that time for about five years, and I, I was ready. I had enough songs. I was ready. And, and um, Dean was the one who showed me and where I got my feet wet on how to go to the studio, get the song recorded, mixed down, how to get it mastered, where to take it to get manufactured, where to take it to the distribution, how to double back, go pick up your money, how to go to certain stores and have a relationship with certain stores and don't even need, you don't even need distribution. You just take it to the store yourself. And literally, you know, whether you leave it with them or they just pay you cash on, on the spot, you just, it's just like, it's like selling dope. You just go around, you sell the music. So um, when I signed a Jive, I had had those years with 75 Girls Records of learning how to do it. And then after 75 Girls Records, I got my own crew together and we did it uh, ourselves and under a company called Dangerous Music. And then Jive came along and I was happy with the independent hustle. I was happy with how far I was going. I wasn't really trying to be a mega star. I was just, I felt like I could make good music and I, I like my lifestyle. It was cool. You know, I was, I was probably the equivalent of a rapper who is who's very popular, but only regional, not all over the country or all over the world, just in a certain pocket. And I was very popular in that pocket. And then Jive Records heard about it, came along, offered us a deal. And, you know, even the money and everything, it wasn't even about that because we were like, everybody in my crew was having money and we were getting it and it was like, we, we were more enticed by um, the, the, the uh, idea of national distribution. Right. On a bigger scale. What bag did they have for you? Um, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was cool. It was nothing. It was not even, it wasn't, they weren't offering us more money than we already had. So, you know, I, um, I've always been a trailblazer for Bay Area music. Right. And I feel like I wasn't thinking like that at the time, but by me signing the Jive Records and, you know, being one of the, probably the first rapper from the Bay to go to a major label, it just opened the floodgates for others to go, man, I think I'm gonna jump in. Which, as everybody jumped in, a few of them did go to Jive Records, uh, Spice One, uh, E-40, you know what I'm right. saying? Um, a lot of people like um, like um, Aunt Banks came along with me. Pooh Man did an album through Jive. Uh, I can't think of everybody that did, but you know, like like guys like UGK, right. Pimp C came to me and said, we signed a Jive, cause Jive had two short. You know? That's fire. I signed a job because they had Kumo D and Houdini. Right. You know what I mean? And they, right. those guys were like hot. Right. And so, you know, it just made sense that as my music was growing, it was time to like get that major distribution. So that's For what sure. it was about. For sure. I just want to ask because I'm blown away by how much artists are getting nowadays. Mm -hmm. I just spoke with Trippy Red. He said, you know, he's, Elliot is resigning mm -hmm. his deal for 30 million. Mm -hmm. Lil Dirk tweeted that he's, Alamo Records is giving him forty million. Hip hop has surpassed, if not all genres, most genres, as far as being the the biggest genre in music. And I think that before me, because I came, I slipped into the game like eighty five. I really started getting it like you know at the end of the eighties, going into the nineties, like going platinum and just being a huge star. But everybody before me was kind of paving the way for the artists of my era. I came along when it was, you know, Public Enemy and NWA, and a bunch of artists were going platinum in the late 80s, early 90s. And I was a part of that wave of all these artists who were selling millions of records. But we were given that platform by the artists before us. Mm -hmm. You know, Run DMC kicked open the door, and the Houdinis right. and the Kumos and the LL Cool J's, they kicked open the door and said, this is huge. This could be done in arenas. This could be done worldwide. And before them, it was all the guys in New York who were really just making rap popular, period, just like taking it to the clubs and, you know, DJing and putting singles out and, you know, Sugar Hill Records and Profile Records and Tommy Boy Records. It was, it was the early 80s, and if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have never had the platform to come in and be platinum. If it wasn't for 
you know, the, the, the Run DMCs and Russell Simmons and Leor Cohen's and, you know, all the guys who jumped it off early on, we wouldn't have had that platform. So as it progressed, you know, later on, it started to be like Death Row and Bad Boy. And it just right. got, you know, cash money came along and, and people started becoming 100 millionaires. And then, you know, after that, people started getting the B word on it and it, hip hop started, you know, having uh, members of the family become billionaires. And I think now what you're looking at is all that trailblazing, all that somebody, you know, being the, the, the front runner and, and knocking down doors. Now you got the number one genre in music and it's ours. So I feel like everything that, look at the NBA, same thing. Same thing. When you talk to the older players, they got what they deserved back then. They got what they, they you know, mm -hmm. what was, was supposed to be done. But look at what they built and look at what players are signing for now, 200 million up front. Right. You know what I mean? It's just like, that's what it is. We are growing, you know, for as sure. a community. For as, sure. You know, you, know, you know who the family is. Um, so yeah, to celebrate 35 years of Born a Mac, you're dropping a new solo album this year called Sir Too Short. And we have 35 facts that people may not know about Too Short. All right, first one, Too Short is a Taurus the Bull, born on April 28th, 1966. You do the math. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was just going to ask if you weren't, because I know you you know, you know, never want to be famous. If you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? Well, speak on the first one. Okay. I'm a Taurus the Bull. Right. So if you notice, if you know anything about this, Taurus the Bulls, like, contribute, like, to the, to just the, just pop culture, what we give to it is like really like timeless shit. Like, and if you went down the list of who the Tauruses were, you'd be like, damn. You know, because I, I feel like Geminis contribute a lot. Right. But if you look at the Taurus list and see who they are, you'd be like, damn, y'all gave us a lot. Like who? Like like Janet Jackson, Buster Rhymes, Chris Brown, you know, just, I mean, the list is long. Right. And you'd be like, damn, all of these motherfucking Tauruses? Like, go, go, go look it up. That's why I say a lot, in a lot of this shit, I'm like, just kind of like research it yourself. And no, just, I hear you. Like, go for it. Or don't, but I'm telling you, that's a part of the reason why Too Short is who he is, because I'm a bull. Gotcha. I stay on that bullshit. Damn. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask what the number one characteristic is for a tourist. That bullshit. The bullshit, okay. <laughs> the number one characteristic is the best and the worst thing that will ever happen to you Damn. will be a tourist a bull. Why worse? Because that's the, that's the spectrum, the spectrum of it. All right. The best and the worst gotcha. all wrapped up in one. That shit is, that's bomb. <laughs> that's some shit you would want to get into. So what would you be doing if you're not doing rap, if you weren't rapping? Uh, my other choices were always, um, outside of being a rapper, I was I always had the out of just go to college, get a degree, get another degree, whatever it may take you. Like, just stay on that safe route of where you could prosper. That was coming from the parentals, and it was easily attainable. It was there. I had the path laid out. Um, the, di the diversion route would have been to become in real, real, real life what Too Short, the entertainer, was as a persona to become that in real life and actually go down that route and pimp my ass off for years. Right. And I was in the right circles, had the right frame of mind, had the right skill set, the right knowledge. But, you know, hip hop, hip hop came along and if either one of those extremes was gonna happen, if I was gonna be like a college kid and you know, my dream was to march in a band at an HBCU, you know? Okay. And I never got that dream. So hip hop saved me from losing that dream. Mm. Uh, I felt like at a young age when I started like, like getting my feet wet and kind of like, like really like loving the pimp world, I studied it and analyze it every way you could to where where I could fit myself in it. And hip hop, you know, put me in that direction. Right. But I was poised to be all I could be on on that pimp shit. Right. But those are such extremes that I think the way I went was the way I wanted to go, was the way it was supposed to be. I didn't I don't know what the legacy of me would be if I was a pimp or if I was a um an accountant or some shit. Right. You know, uh, your last fact, Too Short probably fucked your mama or maybe your aunt. You couldn't wait to get to the last. I'm sorry. <laughs> Number 35 first. Right. Then 20 years later, he fucked your little sister or your daughter. Any way you look at it, Too Short is family. Just speaking on the pimp shit. 
That's a that was a line about family. That was not about anything. Oh, Pippa. okay. Well, I'm connected. That was 100 percent about I'm it, it. I'm a I'm a family member one way or the other. Okay. Some kind of way. Right. Like there's many layers to what makes me a family member. Um, one of your parents, uncle or auntie, used to just religiously bump too short when you was such a little kid that as you got older, I still made songs that came out that were of your era, but you just have it embedded in you, the ones you heard when you were so little. You like, it's like certain artists with me, like some Earth, Wind & Fire or some Ohio Players or some Parliament Funkadelic. I, I, I was a kid listening to the adults listen to that. Right. And then I grew up to make those my artists too. And you know, it's just uh, the music that was given to you that you learned to love. Like a lot of the music you love, right? you found on your own, but a lot of it came from just the house you grew up in and the people, the older people, what they were playing when you weren't in control of, of being the one who played the music. You love those songs. For sure. So Too Short is that to some people. And I'm thinking like, well, if I'm not a family member based on the love that came from the music and how it was introduced in your world, then I'm probably a family member because... When you was little, I used to fuck your auntie. Or, you know, when you was two or three and you didn't even know that you was at the babysitter house, your mama was out fucking with Too Short. I'm, I'm, I'm of that age. And then later on, if I'm not a family member from that era or from the music era, I might be like, you know, you might be my age. Right. And then later on, like, your daughter, like, like daddy, I fuck with Too Short. You're like, Too Short, my age. That's my music. Right. That's my man, daddy. You know, like, it could have happened like that. So... Somewhere in there, like, what is it called? Six degrees of separation? Mm -hmm. Somehow we family. <laughs> Somehow. Too Short is a super player in real life, but he doesn't talk about his relationships in his music. All of his explicit songs are just freaky tales or detailed sexual encounters based on true stories without using real names. Mm -hmm. What is your freakiest song? Is it Freaky Tales? Uh, it's, a, it's a whole list of them, you know, Freaky Tales, Cocktails, Blowjob Betty. <laughs> Blowjob um, Betty, that was the one that got me. Uh, don't uh, uh, call her a bitch. You know, it's a bunch of these songs that just like run you through these stories of um, explicit stories, explicit tales, freaky tales, whatever you want to call them. But the thing is, from the start, there was a comedy element to what I was doing. And it was an intentional element that happened early on in my, in my career before I ever got in the studios. I had said some things on some songs that people laughed at. So I kept trying to say more things because I noticed that I play a song and the one thing that's funny, everybody laughed. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, I gotta do more of that. So that was that was born in me to like have funny punchlines and not just swagged out punchlines, but you know, some swag, some punchlines are like, damn, that was he hard. And other punchlines just actually get a laugh out of you. Right. And other ones you go, ooh, damn, like, you know, like it could be shock value has always been important in hip hop, whether it's True. Gory, like it's just like a visual of something that's like violent and you know bloody. That's cool, <laughs> you know what I'm saying as a punchline. But mine had a lot of humor, and those sexual songs started leaning towards that way. I'm like, if I tell these stories about sex, and then I say something funny two or three times in a song, people love that shit. It's not like, oh, that's gross. It's more like, oh, he a fool. So like, blowjob Betty has a line that says, um. The gist of the whole song is, I bust a nut and killed the bitch. She was sucking my dick, and I came, and the, the nut went so far back and went down the wrong pipe, and she started choking, and she, <laughs> and she died. And I'm sitting there kind of nervous, thinking like, damn, maybe the police going to come looking for me, but then nothing happens. I'm like, damn, I, I bust a nut and killed the bitch. Like, you know, that's the gist of the whole song. So do the girls know they're about them because they're lightweight based on real life experiences? I've had women in my life think that a song was about them when it wasn't. Okay. And I've had women in my life listen to a song that was all about them and didn't really get it. <laughs> Everything in between. So, you know, um, I just don't use the names of the people I know. Because I'm like, even if it's a true story and you know it's you, I'm going to change. I don't, I don't want that shit coming on you or or you mad at me and, and or, you know, we might have had a situation that ended, but damn, who knows if it ain't gonna rekindle five years later. Right. I make a song about you, you ain't fucking with me no more. <laughs> I, um, and then also the story. So if you take a, a true story, so I can hear a story, my homeboy can tell me a story. 
and we all sitting at the table playing dominoes, and he tell a story about some shit that happened to him last night with a chick, and we laughing like a motherfucker. I take a version of what he said and turn it to a too short story. I don't even have to tell him that story inspired it. I just twist it a little bit and make it interesting. If he came back and said, man, you put that shit in the song, I'm like, yeah, dude. I, I, a lot of too short is me sitting around listening to the room and people saying crazy, funny shit. And, and I'm with some pimps and they saying slick shit. I'm like, oh, that's going in the song. You know, and that's just how it is. So the humor is very important. For sure. Um, Cause you know, like, did, did Betty just sound good with Blowjob? Because you know how Plies had Becky, and that was a whole thing. I mean, Blowjob Betty is a, um, is a make-believe character. But then also, back in the day, I used to, I used to have these female character, characters like Jiggle Jenny had big-ass titties. Even Mac Dre even recycled my Jiggle Jenny. Oh, shit. He, he, um, he brought my character back to life. But it would be little names of, like, you know, like Belinda the Blender. I just say that shit, Belinda the Blender, because she blended, you know. Yeah. She, she, you know. <laughs> And then um, uh, it'd be true true stories in there too. Like everybody always asks me, like at the end of Freaky Tales, the last thing I say in Freaky Tales is, uh, "But boy, you never had that TP treatment." And people like go crazy, like, "Bro, what is the TP treatment?" That was somebody's real name. Okay. But I use the initials, and that was a real life. The TP treatment was a real fucking thing, and it was probably like the best goddamn blowjob you would get. As a young man in the city of Oakland, like there was hands down, the TP treatment was, it, that's why they called it the treatment. But TP was her initials. And she was somebody, like she had brothers and sisters and cousins. And, you know, if you knew, you knew. You knew what the TP treatment was. Like, a lot of people knew. Uh, most people didn't. Is there an art to giving a blowjob? Um, giving a blowjob from a male perspective, like receiving it. Of course, it's an art. All right. There's, I don't, I don't think um, there's different techniques. Like if you had to name them, there's like different techniques. But you know, um, what's the too short preference? I like a few different styles of it. I mean, there's this one technique that gets a lot of credit, a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of notoriety. It's um, like the two hands with all the spitting is sloppy, and <laughs> and she just like you just like it just when guys first get that when they're like, oh shit, I ain't never had that. Like the whole messy, you know, noisy, it's, it's bomb. You got to sit on the towel or it's going to mess up the furniture. Or just drip all down your legs and shit. You can get something to wave it up. Um, the deep throaters, the gaggers, deep throaters. The, the deep throaters that don't gag are amazing. <laughs> and then the gaggers make you feel like, a, you know, that's, that's a, that is a real male ego stroking uh, thing to do is gag on, your, gag, gag on, on my dick. And then I get the fucking like, like yeah, bitch, that, that <laughs> the back of your throat, you know that shit. Um, uh, then you have the the cute, the cute, the pretty. So she's so fucking pretty, and she's purring and holding it like it's a trophy, <laughs> and it's delicate, and she's like, you know, she's like, wor you know, worshiping it like it's right. her fucking god. I'm like, yeah, bitch. Um, you have the um, the the marathon. <laughs> I was gonna ask what your longest blowjob was. Like all night or like wake all up, night. Fall, fall asleep. Wake up. I had a I had a chick who um I hate to tell these stories. Like I said, I never use names, but I had a girl who um just that was just her her fetish. That was her thing. So she would like she'd like do you. This the whole interview is not gonna be about sex. Is no, it? it's okay. not. I just she would like do you until you came. Keep going. Come again. Keep going. You're like, I'm not going to come again. And she's like, it don't matter. I'm like, I'm watching TV. It don't matter. It's like, I'm finna go to sleep. It don't matter. I'm like, it ain't even hard right now. It don't matter. She, she didn't want to fuck? No, no, we fuck. But I'm saying when you not, she needed that in her. Like, you wake up in the morning. There she go again. Like, you just sleep. No matter what you do. You're in the car. It's whatever. She just like, she just wanted to do it. And. I mean, we discussed why she wanted to do that. And she said, I fucking like doing it. So mm -hmm. she would do it for hours. And it would be like, a, um, it wouldn't be like a, uh, 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 yeah. uh, uh, uh. it would be a subtle kind of, like she just wanted it in her mouth. I feel you. Does Too Short have a fetish? Do I have fetishes? Um, of course I have fetishes. Like, like I have like, like weird shit that's like fly as fuck to me, but okay. it ain't weird in the sense of doing weird things. It's just like, you know, I've lived in different places and I've seen different styles and, 
You know, it's kind of seasonal with me. Okay. What the what the thing that is specific is seasonal. It it changes. Um, it it goes in from. It goes from types of women to styles of what we get into to what we like doing, what we're not doing it. Like, all this shit's like a... What's this season's fetish? <laughs> what is this season? <laughs> uh, I choose not to say on camera because I'm... Like, right now, I'm not even doing the whole thing right now. I right, feel you. Right now, I'm kind of like... I swear to God, I'm not even lying. Right now... I am totally 100% focused on business. Okay. And the, the reason why is because the quarantine kicked in and it gave me a lot of time to focus on new ventures and new, like time to follow through. And then the quarantine lifted and it's like COVID still, it's still pandemic, but not quarantine. And it's kind of like a cool little environment to kind of not be too wrapped up in outside influences. Like you kind of, Still like six feet, you know what I mean? A little bit, you know? Right. So it meant, meant if, even if you're not six feet and touching, you're still kind of six feet mentally. Mm -hmm. You got everybody gave each other a little bit of space to like, I got excuses now to tell you not to walk up on me. You know what I mean? I like, bro, get out of my air, bro. Like, you know, that type of shit. So right. I'm kind of like hella focused on this business shit and some other shit. So I ain't really doing the, the I'm, I'm not really doing too short. 10, 15, 20 years ago, right now, For I'm not sure. really doing that right now. What businesses? But I, I am I am in season right now, just not gonna say it on camera. <laughs> <laughs> what business? Well, it's a handful of things. You know, I think um, I think that on a platform like this, this would be the perfect place to brag about business ventures. But this is this part of the gist of what I wanna do today is not fucking get into the you see this, you see that. I'm really just Showing you where hip hop gets you to, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna tell I you though, that. I have a handful of business ventures that are lucrative, have been lucrative. Um, I choose not to, you know, certain things I like try to push along the way, maybe like a little social media post or something, but I choose not to go that route of letting everybody know what I'm doing. I just, I've just been that way my whole life. Shit's going on, shit is cool, nigga ain't falling off. But at the same time, I don't ever, not even when I was little, you see me pull up in a nice car, you see me with a bad bitch, you see me at, at the exclusive joint, but I'm not bragging on shit and I'm not really feeling that way like, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. You know, I, I just, that's just not me. Like I work to do the things I do. I worked hard to get what I got. So I just enjoy it. It's a personal thing. Like I don't, I don't need you to know every time I painted the car or flipped the car or the, or the pinky ring changed or got a new set of jewels. I just don't, like, whatever. For sure. I don't, I don't even give a fuck about none of this shit. Like, right. I really don't. For, speaking on the music tip, I think everyone I talk to that has been in the studio with you is like, bro, too short, knock that verse out in, like, however quick, like, you just freestyle. Like, it's so easy for you to knock out a verse and it be fire. Like I wouldn't say it's easy for me to knock out a verse. I would say it's easy for me to be too short. Okay. And... Uh. I have a lot of um, a lot of resources when it comes to writing a two short song, a lot of memories, a lot of information, a lot of uh, Oakland, Bay Area, like this. It's like a built-in internet. You know what I mean? Right. Like a built-in website of all the info I need, and I just kind of like go through it and find the right shit. I could just write a song. It's in a nut. In one word, it's called game. Right. And I listen to rappers and I listen to singers and I listen to, I watch movies and I just, some people have game. You could, you could tell, like, you could tell just in a song, like, oh yeah, bro, I got game. And you could just listen to somebody who's very intelligent, very um, talented and be like, oh, that's a dope song, but you ain't got no game. Like, you just know what game is. You recognize it. Right. Game recognized game is a real statement. For like, sure. Oh, I see you got it. Okay. Okay. Because sure. well, most people don't have it. Right. And. And when I say game, it's, game is a specific kind of knowledge. It's a knowledge that gets you mutual respect everywhere you go. Right. And it allows you to handle yourself a certain way. It's, it's sort of like James Bond or some shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you always say the right things and do the right things. And when you don't, you correct that shit immediately. You right. check that shit in me like, God, dude, I was game goofy just now. You check that shit and you never do that again. Because right. you remember 
the scenarios. Life is a bunch of scenarios. People are a bunch of characters. There's only so many characters and only so many scenarios. When you memorize them all, you game the fuck up. Damn. Period. Speaking of you being one of the most influential rappers from the Bay, you mentioned Mac Dre earlier. What was your guys' relationship? Because, you know, I grew up to the hype movement. I am not one of the most influential rappers from the Bay. You are the... I am the most the, influential okay. rapper from the Bay. Basically because I'm the first, and not only am I the first, but I'm the fucking one who's done it the longest. Okay. And I have the most accolades. You know what I'm saying? That is a combination... I don't call it the GOAT, not the fucking GOAT. It's just a fucking fact. Okay. Not the best rapper. It's just a fucking fact. So what was the question? Oh, well, I was just going <laughs> to... Well, st touching on that, I'll ask about Mac Dre later. Mm -hmm. You released six or seven platinum albums in a row. Mm -hmm. Life is Too Short is double platinum. Mm -hmm. Born of Mac is certified gold, but it sounds scanned 900,000 copies. Which is damn near platinum. Right. And you also have three gold albums. Uh, I, I, I like to... I've never really spoken on this because everybody's doing all these numbers now, trying to like pop that collar. But I'm I'm technically at six platinum albums okay. on the books. Right. But this Born to Mac is up for inspection right now because I remember when it was at 800,000 sound scans. It was gold right out the gate. But then I also remember when they's like, oh, it passed 900. And then everything changed to like downloads right. and streaming. And I haven't really like doubled back. Ain't no more Jive Records. So nobody's right. really counting. And I don't know who might be counting. But I'm like, I just told my people recently, I'm like, let's go investigate on this because I need that seventh platinum. Facts. Because I was checking the clubs. I call the platinum, it's platinum clubs. So you got people with a platinum album, you in the platinum club. You got people who made two, you in the two club. Right. And so forth. There's a lot of artists that had three platinum albums in their career. You in the three club. I'm in the six club, but I feel like I should be in the seven club. Every time you go up to a next level, the numbers dwindle. Mm. And it goes from the six club. It's a lot of us. Go look it up. Right. Seven club. It's a few. Right. We know and love all these artists. I'm talking hip hop. Yeah. Then when you get in the eight on up, it gets to be like just a few. Yeah. You're getting down to just Drake and Wayne and Jay-Z and Snoop. M and Cube and Snoop. Like it gets really small. Pac, yeah. So I'm, I need to just, I, I don't think I'm going to get to the eight club. Cause Why not? I, I did what I did. Okay. All right. But I think they owe me that seven. So I'm trying to get to the seven. And that's like BC Boys and shit. And, I, and I'm telling you, when you count these Platinums, it's a technicality in there that you got to fucking pay attention to. Some of us, not me, some of us who have multiple Platinums, one of those is a greatest hits because mm -hmm. you're so popular when they put the greatest hits together, even that goes Platinum. That shit don't count. <laughs> and all your Platinums, the greatest hits don't count. Really? It don't count. Okay. It don't count. And then, you know, with me, all my shits are solo. Right. So if you, if you a solo rapper who used to be in a group and you know what I'm saying that's technicalities that I'm like I ain't up against okay my shit's a solo so right I, and then my best stat of all in the platinum category is every single artist that had all these multiple platinums had an audience of the east coast the west right. coast down south and the midwest they had a full USA audience I have never got east coast support Can cut that off Cut that whole one third off, which I don't know what the numbers are, that one fourth, cut that off. I took the rest of the country, the South, the Midwest, and the West, and I did everything that they did without a whole fucking region. So I feel like, man, you can't really fuck with the too short shit. Cause my shit, I didn't have a lot of radio hits. I never had fucking, um, I never had like publicists trying to get me on the cover of magazines. Right. The, you know, the label had people that, Jive yeah. had people that was working your shit, but I just let the label do what they do. And platinum, platinum, right. platinum, platinum, right. like one single, two singles, video, not even, like, I mean, never even like, oh, too short's hot, oh, too short, like never. I even had the critics shitting on me the whole time. Like, he's not really a good rapper. It's pretty basic beats. What? <laughs> Like, I, I loved it. Right. I love I love being the under. You know, my favorite thing in the world is when they get on a fucking show with me. There's five, six, seven groups on the same right. show. And they're like, I look at the schedule. I'm like third to the last. There's two, three more groups going on after me or something. And I'm looking at who they are. And I'm like, y'all going to be mad at me. <laughs> y'all going to be mad at me. Because right. I'm pissed 
that I've sold so many records and I'm, I know what my status is with the fans, but then they got these people that aren't as, they aren't as decorated generals as me. And they, they, but they like got the popularity. They got, you know, yeah. this, I'm talking over the years. I'm not talking right now. For sure. I'm talking over the years. Yeah. I've been on a lot of concerts with a lot of groups and artists backstage be fighting about that. Uh, what order you go on? They're like, man, For I'm bigger sure. than so-and-so. They ain't going on before them. Not me. I'm like, y'all got me on? That's where y'all want me at? Yeah. Watch what I do. Right. And I fucking go out there and I make life miserable for anybody <laughs> coming on after me. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm mad that you got me anywhere other than headlining or next to the headliner. Right. If you put me third, of them, I'm like, what? I do a lot of shows where they put me down in that. I'm like, I'm about to bust y'all ass. <laughs> like, period. Like, right. Everybody's going to leave here and say, too short was the best one all night. And then people are going to hear that. The people that came a little late gonna hear that and be like, I miss fucking too short. Yeah. Like, and I, that to the promoter, that keeps me hot too. Right. That keeps me hot. What, well, first of all, I wanted to ask why you didn't, you feel like you didn't get that East Coast support? Uh, the East Coast wasn't really supporting anybody on the West Coast or down South or anywhere early in hip hop. They came along, like certain people started breaking down the barrier and getting love. Little by little, you know, I remember Cypress Hill got love. Um, Shout out to B-Row. You know, um, at, at one point, I think NWA, when they came, I think they was getting the East Coast love. I'm not really sure how much, but because Ice Cube was complaining on West Side Connect. So obviously, and Ice Cube went to New York and made albums with um, the Bomb Squad, which was Public Enemy's production crew. And, you know, I mean, I don't know the extent of what would have led him to do West Side Connect outside of how the media was treating us. Mm -hmm. The media would never give West Coast artists a lot of love because then most of the hip hop media was in New York. Right. And it wasn't like love. It was like mentions and, you know, okay, whatever. But it wasn't love. And then you see like, like a lot of groups that would be like very popular, you know, gold album, gold album, gold album. They got blew the fuck up way bigger than me. Right. And then here I am at the same time, platinum, platinum, platinum. But they're like, but he don't rap as good as these dudes, but he ain't fly on. Like, I'm not dancing. I don't got no DJ. I don't got no dancers. I love when you get on that fucking stage before me or after me. Right. And you come, I walk out that motherfucker by myself and rock the fucking building to shred. They like, they be looking on the side like, who the fuck? I've had people come to me after the show and say, who the fuck are you? Who are you? I'm like, too short, man. I'm from Oakland, man. Right. Right. What the fuck was that? We never heard of you. It'd be like East Coast rappers. Like, we never, and then other, other people would just be like, it'd be like a myth. Right. Like, if you ever get on the show with that dude, too short, man, you should go, you <laughs> should go watch what he did. That's fire. And I just, I don't even sweat. <laughs> Like I don't even I don't even fucking jump up and I don't do shit. <laughs> the whole crowd sing all the words right. and love the shit. And I fucking the show is funny, it's entertaining, and it fucking you better be like you better be of that cloth for sure to to get around you know anywhere around that schedule by me. You better be of that cloth where you're not going to disappoint the crowd. You know, if you got to go, what if you had, what if you was on the schedule and it was too short, then it was you, then it was Ice Cube. You, you that's, that's like a problem. Yeah. And a lot of people, that's not a problem for, but a lot of people it is. Fact. And I'm just like, you, you might have would have wanted to not go in between us because we know how to, we know how to do it. Like, right. and I respect all, to all my artists who know how to work that crowd. You know who, y'all know who, they know who I'm talking to. Like, we just, it's a it's a whole fraternity of us, and you give me that crowd, and you I mean, we just you know R and B artists too. We just whip it's nothing. But some people it's like work for them motherfuckers. Some people it's like a problem. They gotta have the right thing, and they gotta rehearse and do all this shit and all this you know. But others, man, I don't give a fuck. You give me a fucking mic in the crowd, you know it's gonna be a problem. Facts. I feel Period. like a lot of artists nowadays, you know, uh, an artist that's coming up a bigger artist will take them on tour. Mm -hmm. Did you open for anyone that kind of helped you gain more popularity? Did I? I mean, my first, I was just thrown in the, in the fucking water, like, you know, okay. swim. That was the NWA Straight Outta Compton tour. It was like, right. go. Oh, right. But I had had eight years of house parties, eight years right. of- Right, you used to DJ. Of high school dances, eight years of fucking like local shows in the Bay. Like, I I had, I practiced. Okay. Shit, I was, I was that rapper who was, too young to get in the nightclub 
and they would let me perform at the club, but I would have to wait in the back alley until right when it was time for me to go on, go in there, rap, now get out. Did you have a fake ID? No, no, no. I, okay. When I was 21, I looked like I was 12. <laughs> fake ID. I, I never got to go to clubs until I was 21. I performed in clubs before I was 21. All right. But like I said, every single time, I looked like such a little boy. They was like, go rap. That's funny. Now get out. That's hilarious. I couldn't even wait in the building. Like, you couldn't even be in the, in the back room. Like, wait outside. Right. I remember nice. I probably performed at maybe a dozen clubs before I blew up. Mm. I'd be in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else up in there, grown as hell, kicking it. Right. That's cool. I think Vlad started out as a DJ, too. Was that something you wanted to be? Or did you just enjoy it in the moment? No. Uh, hip-hop came out. And hip-hop has four elements. Okay. And the four elements of hip-hop is DJing, which is number one. Facts. Rapping, I always say it was number two. Then uh, the dancing, which is the break dancing, and the graffiti. Mm. And... You don't get hip hop unless you have all four. So a lot of people in the early 80s just ran out the house and was like, I'm fucking doing all four. Right. A lot of people. A lot of rappers, when I was coming up, would just fucking drop on the ground and bust a breakdance and move on you, grab some fucking turntables, start scratching, make a fucking beat, rap their ass off, you know what I'm saying? And then sit there, turn around and start drawing. You're like, <laughs> damn, bro, I could never draw. Yeah. So I looked at hip hop. I was like, I don't want to dance. Like I'm, I'm a two stepper. Right. G I'm gangster. You know, I'm street nigga. So I didn't take to the art or the dancing, trying to perfect them. But the other two, I was like, I can do this. Right. I think that's what hip hop is about. Like if right. you could do one, do that one. If you just love it, love it all. If you love two parts of it, love those two. But it's hip hop, and it it all came together. It all came as a as one. It didn't come as four different things. When it came, it was like, this is hip hop. It wasn't like, oh, rappers are hip hop, like we say now. You know what I mean? And then DJing is, it's EDM, it's uh, you know, strip club, it's all this shit. No, it was fucking hip hop. Right. And I don't think you would have, it's impossible, it, it, the mathematically, scientifically, you could not have the EDM world, house music, electronic, you couldn't have it unless hip hop DJs Put that mixer in the middle and did that thing. Right. Like it, that gave birth to that. Right. You Speaking know? of hip hop, uh, what are your thoughts on just, you know, back then the East Coast, West Coast beef? Cause some people say that wasn't real. It wasn't a West, East Coast, West Coast beef. It was a bad boy death row beef. Okay. And a lot of people tapped into it and said, I'm riding with Tupac. I'm riding with the West Coast. And some of those people were friends and family who was riding for friends and family. Others were dick writers who were just like, I'm with Tupac, I'm with, I'm with the West Coast, you know? And they, and they made it into something, mostly the media. Right. We would all agree that that was a media war. And then um, on the East Coast too, on the West, both, both sides, it was people who were just like, I'll take jabs and I'll be like, I'm gonna ride with my guy or my side. But it really was puffy and shook and personal friction. Right. And they were such huge figures that it became that big. Mm -hmm. And I was in the in the middle. I'm not gonna say in the middle. I was in the circle of it, the inside circle of it. And I understood at the time and I knew for a fact what it was. So it didn't apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like some people, if they stepped in that circle, they was like stepping in some shit and they was like, you, where, where you at? And it'd fucking pull your arms apart if you fucking try to play both sides. But other people, I mean, I knew, I knew where, um, I knew the source and I knew, I knew every fucking, um, aspect of what had happened and why it had happened from Tupac's incarceration, the timing of when he got shot and, you know, at the studio, quiet studio, you know, I mean, I knew about the source shit. I knew what happened in Atlanta when Jake got shot. I knew, um, you know, when the shit moved over to the West and, and then we inevitably lost Biggie and Pac. I right. knew all the things that were going on around that shit. And it was between Puff and Sugar. Crazy. And yeah, ask Puff or ask Sugar right now. I don't know, but right. that's my opinion. What's your relationship with Puff? Hmm? What's your relationship with Puff? I have about the same relationship with both guys. Like, like those two guys at that time were my friends. 
And if I wanted to be on death row, like Suge would have made it happen. Mm -hmm. We had we talked about that. He's like, wow. come to death row, bring. I was like, man, I'm trying to be a label like you. He's like, bring your whole label. Just then come death row. Like Suge Knight was prison cellmates with one of my really close friends, Jock. Okay. And Jock and Suge, when you cellmates for a long time, potentially you could be almost like brothers. Like you got a friendship right. where you spend every day, all day mm -hmm. with a person for a long time. There's something, it, 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 y'all enemies are friends. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't really, I never did a long time, but I know that cellmates come out into the world with a bond. Right. And my really, 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 really close friend had that bond with Suge Knight. So we always had that connection. And Puff, uh, Biggie came to me and just introduced himself. What's up? You know, he, before he was even Biggie, mm -hmm. he was a rapper and he was in Atlanta and he, you know, introduced himself. He was just like Brooklyn, homie. Like he didn't even say his name. And then later on, when he blew the fuck up, he reminded me that was me that day because he was in a limo the day I met him. Oh, wow. And he rode down the window and he was like, yo, kid, yo, you know, got love in Brooklyn. And it was, you know, just a moment. I seen that, you know, he was in character, but I was short, dog, multi platinum. And then later on, he came back. He said, that was me that day. And then we smoked, bonded, became homies and shit. And then Puff called me one day. It was like, yo, um, Big wants you on a song. Mm -hmm. That's how it all started. So I remember the day I went to go do the, the first song with Biggie, um, The World Is Filled. I hung out with Puffy all that day. And I was like, I, I respect him from that day forward. Mm -hmm. I re respect him for what he did that day forward because I'm a hustler. Yeah. And the, the shit that he put down that day, I I know for a fact he probably would never even remember this shit <laughs> if I told it to him because it probably was so normal for him. But he, we linked up and we did so much shit in one day. I would always brag on him. He's one of the people like, you can't really talk bad about him when I'm around because I get <laughs> mad. Cause I'm like, anything you can say about him, I could just get in your ass and be like, man, I can make you a hater. Mm -hmm. If you could pick anything to hate about him. And I, you know what I'm saying? All, of all the things you could say, I always protect Puff Daddy because I seen the hustle, man. I seen it with my own eyes. And I'm like, you know, the nigga is where he is because of the way he is. And most of us ain't got that. I, I would never do what he did that day. Like this motherfucker went to, <laughs> he went to like big ass meetings video shoots, like fucking restaurant. Puff like walk in a room and I don't know why we there. He like having to meet with somebody. Then he turned around and take 15 pictures, then walk out the door. Then we walk in another building. He have a little meeting and then he jump in the box and do a video scene. And then we walk and get back in the car. He go in the fucking, uh, we go in the fucking like just stopping places all day. Yeah. And then we go to the studio. We get there. As soon as we walk in the damn Damn studio, the song was already made before we get there. Yeah. It's got the hook, you know, the verse is open, big up in there. Like, I'm like, these motherfuckers is, it was motivation to see. And then by the end of the day, I, you know, we went to club, we did all kind of shit. And I'm like, bro, how are we doing this? Like, is it, you, you ever heard this thing called sleep? <laughs> and he told me to my fucking face, he was like, you sleep when you die. I'm like, damn, who says that? <laughs> so, you know, um, both of those guys, Puff and Shug, like a lot of respect. And you know, when that shit was going down, I would dare not put my opinion into it mm -hmm. to them personally. Like I wouldn't go, hey, man, what, what's up with Pac and, and Big? Well, I wouldn't, I wasn't that kind of dude. I just leave it be, you know? For sure. And I don't think um, based on who I fucked with and how I am, I don't really think that either one of them was gonna press the issue of. You know, what's up with your old friendship with homeboy? Or, you know, none of that shit. It wasn't Respect. like that. It just wasn't like that. For sure. I think I interviewed Fredro Starr. Mm -hmm. um, he was staying at the in my Sunset Park premiere or one some premiere. Shook had pulled him to the side and like talked about bringing him to death row. He was like, yo, nigga, you need to be on death row. You know what I'm saying? Like, you need to be over here with us. Right. You know what I'm saying? Me, I was like, yo, I'm already on, you know, Def Jam. I'm rolling with Jam Master J already. You know right. what I'm saying? So he was like, don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yo, <laughs> I'm like, yo, word, don't worry about that. How serious were you considering? Okay, so Suge 
was the guy who would come in a room and then he'd get he'd show up at the event wherever it'd be, and then you'd hear like the the wind would blow by and people were like, Shook's here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then some people would be looking scared and other people would just leave. And then other people, you know, it's like, you know, whatever, Suge, Suge here. But I would watch Suge work the room and he would work the room. He would be, it was always work. We've been in a social environment, but he was working for death row. Right. And, you know, he was definitely, um, you know, he was definitely on that alpha shit. You know, the size and the cigar and all that shit. The only time I ever had a, like a situation was, um, <laughs> and I just, I, I personally, um, don't want this taken the wrong way. But the only situation we ever had, she came with me one night and he put his arm around me. That's, that's the, you know, I've seen people get the arm put around them and then it turned into other things. But he put his arm around me. He's like, man, you know, Death Row is home. I'm like, I know, I know. We, we had that conversation. Yeah. But, one night, um, Pac or Snoop, one of them told me to come to a Death Row event, and I pull up, and I got it's about we about eight deep. We come in with nothing but love. We ain't even you know it's just me and the homies, nothing but family. You know we always been family. They they crew and our crew. So we there. They let us right on in. The party is in its early stages. Uh, the 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 stars had not showed up. You know, the Shugs <laughs> and Corrupt and Daz and Snoop and, and, and Pac, they hadn't pulled up yet. Right. They was all coming. They would be there like in the next 30, 40 minutes. We got there before them. So um, we were invited to like the special room and shit. Not too many people there. And it was like, um, they was like, um, y'all grab some food. It's cool. You know, it was all, I ain't, I ain't saying no names who it was, but the people who invited us in was those people. Mm -hmm. It was, it was the, the family. They, you know, the people that was setting it all up, the boys was coming. So we grabbed some plates. We ain't touched the goddamn food. We ain't, you ain't nobody put a fork to a, a bite. And then they all got there. And Suge was like, he said, um, hey, what you doing, man? What y'all doing? I was like, you know, the lady told us, you know, it's cool, get some food. He was like, man, you gonna eat our food before us? And I was like, I said something like, nah, man, the lady, he's like, oh, she gonna buck up on me short? And then, the homies, like, everybody know everybody. And it seemed like an invitation, like, oh, uh, yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? And just instantly, everybody was just like, man, shit, man, you know, we, we family, bro. Like, like, like it, 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 all the reality came back, bro, it's us, man. It, 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 this, nobody disrespecting your food. It stopped. But that was like a real, that was the only moment where, hey, you like, I was like, damn, shit, you're not going to fight me over my food? Damn. But, but, you know, it was a misunderstanding. And right. You know, from from that point on, I mean, we we never. That was the only little moment where I seen because I've been in a moment where I wasn't the guy, and that person in that situation said the wrong thing. <laughs> right. What happened? That I mean, that was that. It's his family. We all family. Like we was family, and it was just you know it was a misunderstanding. He, at that moment, he hadn't known that they pulled us in, invited us, and told us get out. Right. He just saw, damn man, y'all ain't even us, and y'all you not fool before we got that, which. I get it. Yeah. I get it, but that's what happened. That's my only even close story. Outside of that story, we got a hundred other stories. Right. Like, What's up, man? No, no. How y'all doing? What's up? Yeah. The love. The real love. Have you talked to him recently? You want to know a little known fact that's not on my list of facts? Yes. <laughs> please. In 2015, mm -hmm. let me tell a story right. In All 2012, right. <laughs> I'm famous for being on TMZ when the police tried to arrest me for a DUI and I turned around and ran and then I tripped and they, you know what I'm saying? I ran, I probably Wait. ran like one, two, three, four, bloop, and they got, everybody's like, ah, too short, sure I ran for the police. Ah. But nobody really knew that. I was behind the supper club, the famous supper club. Uh, in Hollywood? Yeah, and I had an apartment that was one block from supper club. So literally my apartment was out the parking lot and right there. And it's the middle of the night. I probably, I had left the club. It was like 3.30 in the morning. I had left the club at two. So I'm an hour and a half later, but I'm, I'm tipsy. He doing all this shit. I'm doing it. I'm not even feeling drunk. But then he said, you had to blow. So I, the officer was a young black dude. And I'm like, I did all this shit. I, was, I told him, you know, it's my car. 
He got my driver's license. I live right there. And I say, man, is that the only option? Like, I can't, you know, just, bro, I'm like right there, bro. You tripping, man. I did all this shit. Like, I'm, I'm going to walk home. We can leave my car here. He was like, you got to blow. I'm like, there's no other option. He said, yeah, I could take you to jail. You could do a blood test. I just took off running. I was like, I'm going home. So I'm like. And you fell? So he, I fell. He jumped on top of me and he says, <laughs> you can give TMZ 10 more minutes and hits his school. I don't care. But he jumps on top of me like for the arrest. He goes, what are you doing? Why are you trying to run? I was like, I'm trying to go home. I told you I was trying to go home. Fuck. The fuck are you talking about? The, all this shit. <laughs> I get all the good lawyers. I do all this shit. This is 2012. Right. But 2015 comes <laughs> and it gets to the point where three years I've been dragging this shit on through the, the court system. And they call me. I, everything's cool. I got all this shit worked out, community service, all this shit. They they contact me and they say, um, your community service was a fraud. We we can prove that you weren't there. And they called me to court. So I bring all the proof of what I did. The whole did little it. folder and the DA assistant, whoever she was, I'm we had we meet outside the court before court started. And I show her the shit and she opens her folder and she got the same shit I got. She's like, I already seen all that. She's like, if you go in there and show that to the judge, I'm going to charge you with uh, filing false paperwork. And then on top of that, I'm gonna charge you with some other shit, but you know, whatever, whatever, not doing your shit and all that shit. She said, but if you go in there right now and just tell the judge that you don't have the paperwork, don't, you know, don't say you're going to get it later. Just say, I don't have it. I recommend you get 30 days and you probably go in there, turn yourself in and be out in a few hours in LA County. My lawyer goes, we don't want to fight her. Let's just, just do the shit. And I'm like, I got all the paperwork. My shit is legit. She's trying to hit me on this one thing that I did a show in San Diego and my community service was in Oakland. I'm like, well, yeah, I did it. And I jumped on the plane and even and went and did the show. She said, I don't even care. You could prove that one. I got two more on there that you couldn't prove. And I'm like, my, my lawyer didn't want to do it. He's like, just do it. So I go in and I get railroaded. Same, 15 minutes later. I don't got the paperwork, Your Honor. You, a week earlier, I said I'd be back with the paperwork. He's like, you lied to me? And she goes, yeah, Your Honor, we uh, recommend 30 days. He goes, 90 days. Wow. So they still going, 90 days in LA County. You're going to do two days. You'll be out. I'm like, I ain't tripping. Okay, it's cool. I went that motherfucker. They kept me for five weeks in LA County, which is very stressful. Yeah. And the whole gist of the story was every time I got a visitor, which was every Saturday, for, I don't know why, they put me in the little bitty cubby hole right next to Suge. Oh, wow. So, so nobody was really seeing Suge a lot then because he got locked down. It was 2015. I don't know when he went in, but you could check. Yeah. 2015. And we had like the visit. I was there five weeks. I probably saw him three or four times in the visit. And we chop it up, you know, the same quick. How y'all doing? How you doing? Like, like his family be visiting him and shit. And we just, you know, get a couple moments and it was cool like that. Yeah. But that's the last time I seen him. Mm, and 2015, wow. Yeah. We both like shackled the fuck up in the orange jumpsuits. Oh my God. With the orange top and bottoms, yeah. Wow. How how was your mental state back there for five weeks, no, thinking you'd be there for two days? Well, about a weekend, Lori was like, um, they, they hit me with this, uh, you can't get out because they had me in some section called high power, which is sort of like protective custody or something, protecting you either from yourself or just not coming in contact with other prisoners because you're a celebrity. So I'm in this motherfucking like, wing where like it's just you just sit in this motherfucker by yourself all day it's just really fucking like it's really boring but i would have took that over like going out and and duking it out all day with whoever or just all the politics that come with I, i'm like cool i just sit here and i fucking sat in that motherfucker for about a week and didn't do shit and i was like oh, i'm not going home i like wrote a book I wrote, I wrote hella songs I was like, I came out that motherfucker like detox, like a mud. Detox was the best thing ever. Right. Like no weed and no motherfucking liquor for five weeks. I felt good. Right. I came out feeling good. Right. That's good. I'm glad. Speaking of Suge uh, Knight, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about Snoop acquiring Death Row? 
That's huge. Well, you know, Snoop is my group member. We have the, uh, the Mount, group Mount, Mount Westmore. Westmore. I was getting there next, but all right, we can Too go there short, first. Ice Cube, E40, yes. Snoop Dogg. Yes. And we talk quite often, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what he's doing. I think uh, just like we talk about um, at some point, you know, it's like what I, what I feel like I'm doing with my new album is I'm just doing it for the culture. I'm doing it for the, the period point blank statement of, Man, you can't be no 50-year-old fucking rapper. What well, shit? Too short did it. E-40 did it. You right. know? Jay-Z did it. Like, right. like I want to be a part of the narrative that rap is not, does not have an age limit. For sure. Why are you naming it Sir Too Short? Why did they name me Sir Too Short? Well, that's what the album you're dropping is called, right? Mm-hmm. That's my name. Okay. <laughs> Just make Like, sure. I have vi different variations. Too Short is a variation. For sure. Short is really my name. Before any of them variations came, they called me short. Short dog was a badge of honor that I earned because I was, you know, a dog ass player. Like right. I earned it early on short dog. I wouldn't tell you the stories because I probably get people get mad at me if I told you how I earned my short dog name. <laughs> um, real quick, Mount Westmore, uh, Snoop, Ice Cube's. Mm -hmm. How like I know y'all performing soon. I know y'all released Big Woofer. How does it feel to just come together? Because this is a beautiful moment in hip hop in West Coast. It's just a, it's a smart move for sure. That was um, thought up by E Forty on the Ice Cube, and then they brought me and Snoop in, and because it was a great idea. And I mean, it's a simple idea. We always do shows together, booked by promoters who call us individually and get us on the same show. Right. We look out in the crowd. It's a sold-out arena, and, you know, if you add up the math to what they paid all of us, it wouldn't be the same number as if we all were together and they had to get us as a mm. package deal. Okay. So it's like, not only do you look at groups like The Temptations, mm. The Supremes, you know, The Motown Review, Smokey Robinson, The Four Tops, and forever in life, they could put that package together and tour the world. You know, we are the same thing. It's the same thing. You know what I mean? It's like multiple platinum albums, millions of fans. We get together. Not only does the show, does the show sell out because it's all of us, but everybody has a good time all night. Every, sure. All of us do a really good show. So we're thinking like, what happens if we do this together? It's bomb. But as businessmen, we're like, well, shit, we might as well give it a name and then record a bunch of songs together and give it a, a, a product. So then we got merch and all this new shit. These guys are thinking, they think like, they're not thinking, hey, let's make an album together. Oh, let's do a tour together. They, they think way like, yeah. what's the, everything you can milk it. It's Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, E-40. Think, think about it. The, when, when it came to me, I'm like, if my group member is a Snoop Dogg, let's give it E-40. You know, should I, should I not join this group? Like, right. think about it. You know what I mean? Right. I'm in a group with fucking hustlers. For sure. And everything's a fucking hustle. Right. Everything. I will tell you this much. The genius of Mount Westmore. We released one record. Big subwoofer. And the group has generated millions in income. Really? Through touring, merch, and haven't even... The music has whatever... We recorded 50 songs. Whatever that 50 songs is going to bring hasn't even been factored into what is being made at this point. Wow. I mean, just mostly the shows alone, but adding in what the merch is doing and is going to do, it's it's like, it's like it's genius on those guys' for part. Sure. I can't take credit for it, but it's genius. 50 songs. So how many songs are going to be on the album? Probably uh, somewhere between, you know, more than 15, not quite 20, somewhere okay. in there. Okay. That's a good number. Mm-hmm. Speaking of shows, you actually took Kid Rock on his first tour years later. Well, Easy e took me on my first tour. Right. First and foremost. Right. And people watched the movie. I know a lot of people that went on that tour and a lot of people that were around at that time. And people don't really say, man, it didn't happen like that. Like, they don't really get off into all that. But they, they say a, a whole lot more happened that day or happened right when that happened. It was a whole lot more to it. But you got to... A movie can't tell that whole fucking, right. you know, you got to tell a good story, a great story. You can't tell every fucking detail. So 
I would watch the movie, I've seen it probably like a handful of times, and a lot of that shit coincided with places I was at and things I was doing, and I, you know, I was very close to that shit. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, Easy E brought me in, called me, and you know, he's like, "You want to go on tour?" And I'm like. Yeah, shit, because they had boys in, boys in the hood are always oh, hard. Yeah. And that was hot. And I had, these are the tales. The, the freaky, freaky tales. tales. <laughs> so then I dropped Life is Too Short. And my album came out the gate. I had never been anything except local. Born and Mac was picked up by Jive. Born and Mac came before Life is Too Short. It was picked up by Jive and sold a few hundred thousand copies. It didn't even go go right out the gate. But Life is Too Short was the first album that I recorded and released with Jive. Mm -hmm. I dropped that. It goes 300,000 copies out the gate. Like, I remember seeing a, a promo thing they had. Life is too short. 300,000 copies in three weeks. And that was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, out the gate, 300,000 copies. So, Easy got it. I mean, they had just dropped um, Straight Outta Compton album. And that motherfucker was doing better than my shit. It was out there. And... Easy called me. He's like, you want to go on tour? And it was like, you know, it was like a no-brainer. Like, we was the hottest shit moving up and down the coast. Like, let's go. I was like probably the greatest supporting act you could fucking <laughs> get at shit. Because I was seasoned. Like, that was my first tour, but I was seasoned on stage. Right. I was, I was, I knew how to work the fuck out of crowd. When I went on my first tour, I was, I, it was no learning curve. I was already there. Okay. So, um. um Were you go, nervous? That's a lot of people. Nope. I used to have this little weak ass um, intro that everything about me has always been like, like it don't need no flair, okay. no glitter, no diamonds, no nothing. So I just had this box. They can't see this, but it kind of looked like the light you got right there. Okay. So it's the box with the light shining from the back. So you're inside the box and all you see is a silhouette. It's a simple ass stage intro that people have used in many different aspects from mm -hmm. fucking Cirque du Soleil to everything, the silhouette box. So it's my first tour. I'm sitting, I'm standing there in the box and the, the white curtain comes up. You see my shadow and the curtain comes up and it's really me. And that was my one effect. All that was like some dollar signs, some dogs, or some, you know, dog, my microphones and a dog bones, hella, hella basic. But for people to see Too Short for the first time, the motherfucker was going crazy, crazy. Easy e took us NWA. We went around to all the arenas. That was my first taste of it. Later on, uh, right after that, Ice Cube quit the group. And Ice Cube went solo. He did the album with um, America's Most Wanted. And we was homies. Ice Cube was my homie. And we got in touch with each other. It's like, you know, I don't know whose idea it was or who made it. I don't know. We just went on a, a, a tour as co-headliners where a lot of nights he closed the show. A lot of nights I closed the show. We had a really big song together. It was a, uh, a bitch ain't nothing but a word to me. Mm -hmm. Bitch ain't nothing but a word. We would do that song together. Crowd go crazy. Like we, we, you know. Uh, I was told that you could bring one group. Ice Cube brought Yo Yo. Okay. Because that was his artist. Yeah. And I was like, you know, Kid Rock was my homie, so I brought Kid Rock. Oh, okay, interesting. I was like, I, I put him on the tour, and I knew he, right. I knew he would make the most of it, and. Out of anybody I knew at the time, like he was the person I felt earned, deserved the slot. Crazy. And I really, to this day, believe it was a good decision because it probably helped him a lot with his development on stage. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's great to know how big he became mm -hmm. and that I was able to throw an assist at a young age. Totally. And then, you know, D-Nice was on that stage. D-Nice, the DJ. D-Nice was on that tour. He, um... Oh, wow. Because he had a song. They call me D-Nice. Uh -huh. He had that song out. So, and it's good to see D-Nice, like, you know, balling like he is right now. And it, this whole entertainment thing is a fraternity. It's a family. Right. And so many, on so many levels and so many different eras and places and times and years, Too Short is family. <laughs> and that's what that whole list is about. Like For you, sure. You get that part of it, but you might... Like, too short, like my Uncle Short. But you might have fucking forgot what Uncle Short did. Yeah. You might have fucking forgot the journey and the ride that I just had along the way. And we in, we in the kind of industry, hip-hop, where every little, every so often, like, some people do it very often. But you got to keep reminding motherfuckers in hip-hop, like, you know who the fuck I am, right? 
you know, I don't got to beat it down, you, you know, beat you up with it all the time, but you got to remind these motherfuckers every now and then. Like, if I wouldn't, if I would have never made Blow the Whistle, it could be a debate right now today. Like, who, who came up with the word bitch? Yeah. Like, people would debate the shit. Blow the Whistle was, at that time, it was like the story was branching out. Of the origin of bitch. And I was like, nah, y'all ain't y'all ain't finna take that from me. Is it crazy to you that Blow the Whistle still hits every time it plays? Is Little that- John made the beat. I know. All right. I wrote the lyrics. <laughs> it's not much to the song except the beat and the lyrics. Right. And neither one of us knew that that song would do what it did. And to this day, it's probably the one thing we always mention something of it. Because it gets sampled a lot. For sure. It do, it has many, many like viral clips. Oh, yeah, Sweetie sampled it. I mean, it has all these viral clips and weird stories around the world. Uh, what Blow the Whistle did. And every time me and Lil John see each other, we had we, we got a cool little relationship. Right. But that's probably the one thing we mentioned something blow the whi- blow the whistle-ish <laughs> every time we see each other. Man, blow the whistle still, man. Can you believe? Can right. you believe? Like, it was 15 years, and we like, like, can you believe it? For sure. It's How was going? it taking Lil John on the on tour? Um, Well, Lil John was in the music industry. He was a successful local DJ, and he was doing production for So So Def, uh, So So Def Bass All-Stars, and he had a job at So So Def. He was A&R. So he, was, oh, yeah. he had an office. He was there. Right. He was Jermaine's guy. In the industry, people knew him, Little John. And he made this record, Who You With, Kid Crock, Who You With, To the Flow, To the Flow. You go back, you do the research. <laughs> <laughs> so that song later became um, Duro. Uh, oh, wow. And what's that, Candy Paint song? Whatever yeah, song yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same beat. Wow. Ice Cream Paint Job, that's on that beat. Little John had that out years before that. And it was it was hot. It was hot all around the, what do you call that? The Southeast region. Mm-hmm. He was hot. And I told Little John, I was like, I didn't even know him, but I knew him as a DJ. And I always, always admired his DJ skills because DJs play songs. And they'd be like, so-and-so in the house or whatever, right? But Little John would DJ and he would be saying stuff. And it would be sort of a call and response and just all kind of shit. But he knew how to say stuff, and his DJing was like an artist doing the show. Mm. Like, he was rocking the crowd. And I was like a Little John fan before he was famous. He was a local DJ. He had that one song, and I knew who the fuck he was. I was a fucking fan. <laughs> and I always was like, I hear that song on the radio, and I was like, that's crazy, and nobody rapped on this song. It's just them talking and chanting and making noise. and. I was like, bro, let's do a remix. First time I ever approached him. I was like, let's do a remix with me rapping on there. Mm. He was like, nah, that's old, man. Let's do something new. I was like, all right, let's do something new. And he came to my studio. I'd fly a studio in Atlanta, my first location. And I wasn't there when he came there. And, you know, whatever, I hooked it up. So, you know, they let him in the studio. And he stayed there. I don't know how long, but he left a couple of beats. And this one beat he left was uh, it's called Couldn't Be a Better Player. Well, I named it Couldn't Be a Better Player. I don't know what the fuck his original version of his mind would have been, but it had a hook. What the fuck you gonna do? Hey, what? What the fuck you gonna do? What you gonna do? And they had a little intro. Us niggas in the side be representing the shit and try to keep a player hit us up. I did, because he's busting anything like acting rude, whatever the fuck it was. So the, he had the intro, he had the hook. And I like added another hook and put three fucking 16 bar verses, which made it a song that was damn near six minutes long. Mm -hmm. But we had this song, it was called Couldn't Be a Better Player. You couldn't be a better player than me, even if you fucked every day of the week. I know you think you got it like that, but peep, I be fucking hoes every day of the week. Like that shit was hot. I love it. Like from what he did on Who You With to that, I mean, it was like, if you was of age in Atlanta that year, which would have been 96, 97, I don't know what fucking year it was, 97, something like that, I don't know, 90, I don't know, I don't know what year it was. But if you was there, that was just shit. Right. Period. And 
after that, we did be a bitch. You uh, know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I remember be a beer was a song called You Just a Bitch. And it was the same music. Dun, 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 dun. You, know, you know the beat? How the fucking beat go? <laughs> but it was the same beat. And instead of going, be a bitch, the hook was, you just a bitch. You punk ass bitch. You ain't nothing but a bitch. And he had a, he had a, a that was on the B side. It was a single. On the A side, it was, um, I like them girls. It was like a up tempo dance kind of the vibe he did with the uh, so so deaf yeah. all stars. So I like them girls was a single, and he hit me up one day or seen me somewhere one day or something. He's like, man, the B side is moving. Like <laughs> he like the A side had a video. You know the video was hot. He was out there. He said the B side is moving. <laughs> so he had to figure out a way to make the B side a clean version, and he came up with that B B S. Did a remix. Added Ludacris. Song became a big hit. But there's a whole nother version called Just a Bitch. You Just a Bitch. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Facts, motherfucker. Facts. <laughs> I could run this shit all day. You mentioned the NWA tour. Uh, what do you think of the conspiracy theories around Easy E's death? Um, well, you know, I said this shit early on. And the more years went by and the more knowledge that came out about HIV and AIDS, it still seems a little out of place to me that even the way they portrayed it in the movie, even the way I remember it happening in real life, you know, easy, like, in a nutshell, I can say it really fast. He was like, <clears throat> my chest hurt, and then fucking died of AIDS. You know what I mean? And it's like, what happened to HIV? What happened to actually, you know, having AIDS and then deteriorating? Like, you just, oh, Doc, my chest hurt, and then you died, like, something fucking happened. Like mm. something happened, something other happened. I don't know what. I could never even pinpoint what it might be. Right. But I know it wasn't fucking HIV AIDS. Like he didn't. Because at that time, not enough people in our community, nobody had really the knowledge of what that is. So it was the kind of story that kind of like, damn, the easy, they fucked a bunch of bitches and died of AIDS, you know? But everybody that I knew since then, that contracted HIV and then had AIDS. It was a they died. It was a long death. It wasn't my chest hurting and coma and dead. It wasn't wasn't that so, you know. And then right off the rip, we kept waiting on. Well, who else had it? Nobody else had it. No baby mamas. No girlfriends. Nobody had it. That's crazy. So you just you just fuck some random bitch one night that gave you the AIDS and everybody else you never fuck me. I don't. It just seemed very right. I'm not the only person who feels like this, but. You know, I have a million conspiracy theories. We could do a whole nother day on that. <laughs> Damn. You know what I'm saying? I mean, another one is uh, my guy, Pimp C. Right. Who Rest was like my little brother and who I saw probably 48 hours before he passed. Wow. And I was supposed to meet up with him the day he, not the, I don't know when he passed, but that Saturday he came to my show. And Saturday we said, let's go dinner tomorrow. And then Sunday we got on the phone and he was like, Man, I'm busy. I'm like, damn, I'm busy. We couldn't meet up. And then Monday, I didn't talk to him. And then Tuesday, they found him. And wow. I'm like, I'm like, so right off the rip, I'm like, what happened? What happened? Like, what happened? And all I get back is, well, he was in his room by himself, and they found him. I'm like, well, was the door? Did it have that thing on it? Like, was it the lock? Like, like, tell me something. Like, you know what I mean? And the most I could get was, I never got if the door was locked or not. I had to break it down. Because if the door wasn't locked, that means somebody left out. Right. If the door was locked, I mean, he felt good. He locked it. He was in there. Right. It, it's a whole different level of what happened. A lot of shit goes out the window if I just know that part. Right. But then it's like I heard some shit about he had his clothes on or something. I don't know. Like, I, I don't really know if I was just true, but I just heard parts like, I'm like, what happened to my guy? Right. And then they come out with the official. It was a mixture of some stuff, the prescription and something else or something that I don't really know. But- with me, I never really heard uh, something that would give that closure for me. Mm -hmm. I never really heard anything tangible or true, like what happened to my guy. Right. So that's I, crazy. I, I have this theory that's bigger than just Pimp C, and there's a lot of mysterious celebrities, a, a lot of mysterious celebrity deaths mm -hmm. in hotel rooms. Wow. 
and all these celebrities die in these hotel rooms by themselves. And what do you think happened then? I don't know what happened to them, but I know that when you die, everything gets all valuable and shit. I don't, you know, it, you know, you you get marketed in a different way when you're dead. So one one of the things you got to look at as soon as a celebrity dies is it was it a homicide? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got all these like mysterious like OD. It could be OD or suicide or just found dead. It's just a lot of celebrities. I think I don't think I've, I've mentioned this shit out loud quite a few times, but I don't think anybody ever went and really. There's nothing on the internet about celebrities that died alone in hotel rooms. Crazy. There's a long list. Yeah. Of famous ones, not so famous ones. Back in the day, it's been happening forever, mm -hmm. forever. How did that affect you, just losing, you know, close friends throughout these years? Well, I'm telling you how it affected me. I never really got the fucking answers right. on what the fuck happened. And right. it bothers me because he was in L.A. It bothers me because right. I was supposed to meet up with him day before. It bothers me because I just, we had an amazing night just falling out. I did a show at the House of Blues, sold out. He pulled up to the show. He gets on stage. He literally played my hype man all night. Like, right. he was ad-libbing and doing the hype man for me on stage during my show. I think that was the last time I ever did House of Blues. And it's just, it's just an amazing memory. And then I lost my guy. And it's like, to this day, I'm still like, I st I'm still looking for, like, what the fuck happened? Right. Like, what the fuck happened? And I I um, yeah, that's, I, I know he's going to bring that one up. That kind of, that one, that one really affected me. That's like, that always brings up some shitty ass feelings, you know? For sure. Like Pimp C is a real, it's a part that don't really go away with that guy. Right, for sure. Did you ever uh, like sip or, you know, dabble? Um, one night I uh, was in Houston, Texas. And, you know, I'm a guy like, I ain't going to lie. I'm not going to do crack <laughs> or fucking heroin or nothing of the heroin family. Like back in the day when I was a youngster, when the crack first came out, we would take the rocks and smoke them in joints. But then we realized somewhere down the line that that shit was super addictive. Mm. And if you was smart, you got to fuck off that shit and quit smoking them. We called them uh, Grimmies. Okay. Everybody in every city had a little nickname for them. But luckily, uh, those things right there would lead you to actually being a pipe smoker. Luckily, that didn't happen on this side. But I shy away from the cocaine and the heroin and all that. I, I did my little dabbling in the cocaine world. Snorted a lot of coke in the 80s. Got that out the way. But uh, I'm not um I'm not afraid to like be in a certain city, and you go, well, you know, out here, man, we all we smoke is PCP. Right. I'm like, well, shit, let me hit that shit <laughs> and take a little hit and see what it do. I'm not. A, I, I know that the narcotics of like the heroines and the shit. I'm. Mm -hmm. Those are very addictive things. I'm not gonna try crystal meth or. Or fucking hit a crack rock or something. That's like none of that's going. That addiction shit. I don't even like dabbing because <laughs> I have a rule. If you do drugs, if you take a drug, and ten seconds later you're high, that ain't the drug you want. So I don't take. I don't do any drugs that get you high instantly. That's stuck. Like I respect that. So, um, I was in Houston. And you know, it was a sip and syrup, syrup environment. For sure. For one time, I sipped. I was like, give me some of that shit. I forgot what flavor of soda I used, but I sipped. And we even um we dipped we dipped a blunt in the whatever they pour in the thing, they they dipped the blunt in the syrup. That was a, a Oh shit. Like I, I I don't know what the Term shit was. Yeah. But, um that one night, yeah. I know what it is. How was it? How'd it feel? It shouldn't make you sleepy. I don't know. Oh, okay. I, it wasn't my drug. It's not my right. It's not my choice. And later on, to come to find out that is of the opioid mm -hmm. origin, I'm, you know, I'm glad that I didn't take a liking to it. I think that um, I'm, I'm really not for things that get you that addicted, things that you have to, cigarettes. I used to smoke cigarettes in high school 
And when I quit smoking cigarettes, it was very hard. Right. It was a like excruciating experience just to quit. It took me a week. And then after that week, it was like painful to watch people smoke and you know, Congrats, a I week? That's it? Hmm? I feel like a week is pretty good for cigarettes is addicting. But I was making a lot of money okay. to be a rapper on stage, and the cigarettes was making me be out of breath. I love I had been that. smoking 10th, Respect. 11th, 12th grade after high school, and Respect. then I get on stage to get like, you know, five, ten thousand 10,000 a night, and I'm like out of breath. I'm like, yeah. fuck these cigarettes. I respect so I quit. That. I quit for the job. Right. And then... um. You know, just things like that. You hear the story about what people got to go through to get off heroin. And I'm like, just kind of don't, don't do them kind of shits. Avoid them shits because them Oxycontins and shit, all them shits. Just if, avoid that shit in life if you can. I had surgery only on my little big toe, but it was surgery. Right. The day I got the surgery, I fell off a motorcycle. Damn. The day I got the surgery, they put that thing where they call it a block, block, they freeze your whole mm -hmm. fucking numb your whole damn ankle up just for a little toe surgery. <laughs> and they gave me the pills and the prescriptions and shit. It was oxycotton, oxycodone, whatever the fucking name of that shit is. Mm -hmm. And I got home from the surgery and at like five in the morning, I, I got out, the, it was a one day thing, going to the hospital like 10 in the morning, do the surgery. I'm, I'm back home at 5 p.m. So I'm sitting there, got the foot in the air and um, fell asleep. Just off what it, what it, you know, I wasn't, I didn't take none of the pills or nothing. Five o'clock in the morning, my fucking toe woke me up like it was, like it was a doctor down there cutting it open. Like the, all the pain, just the, the shit wore off. All the pain came. I grabbed that fucking bottle, whatever it was, taking one or whatever it was. I took the fucking pill. I remember mean, it was like four or five in the morning. I woke up at like 10, like, like took the pill and I woke up 10 in the morning. And woke up and that shit started hurting again. Mm. I was like, fuck, I took another one of the painkillers. It was like 5 p.m., like two seconds later. I'm like, damn. So then get up again and then the pain kick in. I took another one. It was the next morning. I was like, I ain't taking no more of these motherfuckers. Like, I'm talking like, it was just like you blink. And it was like six hours later. The next day, I was in so much motherfucking pain. I don't know who I gave them pills, so I was like, you can take this shit. I don't, I just, that shit just hurt forever. I was like, I've right. never taken that shit. Like, I'm not taking anything that blanks you out. You, you can't remember what happened the last six hours? Yeah. I don't know if I was asleep or awake. I don't know if I was walking around or not. Right. Fuck that. <laughs> and then I heard that these are the ones that if you take them for a few days, you hooked. Fuck that. Crazy. What so, you, you know, I'm against all that type of addictive stuff. I am. I respect that a lot. I actually interviewed, well, I don't know if you saw Juice World's documentary. Mm -hmm. um, homie was popping like 10 perks, like nine, mm. like so many perks. You know what I tell people in LA? Don't come to LA and start snorting coke. <laughs> That's one of my key uh, go-to advice. Like, those don't get into the snorting coke. And they're like, coke, like, people say shit like this. Have a night hanging out with some new friends. They turn them on to snorting line. They come like, I fucking love cocaine. <laughs> like, I bet you fucking do, but watch what I tell you. Hang around that shit for about a year and watch who you are out here in LA. That shit. That that going in that life and like the wrong person telling you the wrong thing is like cool and fly. I mean, you know, I can't intervene and hate on it. Mm -hmm. But if you get an earful of what I got to say, I'm like, bro, stick to the weed. Drink some drink if you want to, you know, occasional Molly or something. <laughs> and then with this fentanyl, I'm like, I'm I'm really against a lot of shit. This shit's scary. Right. That somebody invites you to take a one on one and you fucking die. You just want to bump it and you die. That's fucked up. Like it ain't right. this ain't what we out here having fun for. Right. So I'm I'm really I'm really against the the opioid. I respect that avenue, whatever you want to call it. Right. So. Sip and syrup, you know. I, I, how many rappers are coming up right now going, I want to get off this shit. I just got off it. I'm like, it's like it's hard. Right. Shit's crazy. But so. then what do you think about someone like DMX who went to rehab? You know, I'm sure he wanted to stop, but he couldn't. And it's just such an L for hip hop, I feel like, when these things happen. It's life. It's like, it's life. Okay. It reflects real life. That's what's true. happening in hip hop is a reflection of what's happening in life, and it's really happening out there on a way larger scale in hip hop. And, For sure, that's true. You know the people who are ODing. This, this is a whole thing. I know with the opioids, with the fucking, you know, with the 
people out there who brought that shit to the table and made billions and are making billions. And to this day, we still don't have a, a, a fucking solution for saving lives. So, right. you know, I don't know, man. I just, I, I, I'm like, I, I learned to enjoy my little weed and my, um, and my drinking, like, you know, that pills and powders is like not, not popping right now for me. I feel that. I respect that. Uh, real quick. You and E-40 released a song called Rapper's Ball that inspired the names of at least three major rap artists, Jeezy, Weezy, Yeezy. Can you touch on that? These are facts that you need to either agree with or dispute. And these are facts. Yeah. And I would love to be told the other truth or your truth or what you think is the truth. You know what I'm saying? But this is what I know. And... The three rappers you just named, we had the song, it comes on, Rapper's Ball, listen to the beginning. Too Sheezy, E Feezy, <laughs> you know, K Sheezy and the hug, off the Heezy for Sheezy. Like it was so fun to say and cool, it led Snoop Dogg to going for shizzle, my dizzle. Like he got that from that and spent it. And then it became pop culture. And I don't say this shit to be like, yeah, we did this shit, bro. Because yeah. E-40 has seeped a lot of fucking little isms sure. <laughs> into pop culture. And the Bay Area as a whole has seeped a lot of isms into pop culture. And I just think that that's one of them. I, I just, those are facts that you might not know that when we did that little intro and said that on the song, it became such a part of popular culture embedded into the culture that later on when Kanye was like, you know, call me Yeezy now. It, 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 that's what gave birth to that. Right. When Lil Wayne was like, flip it to Wheezy. And when Young Jeezy changed his name, which I think his name was like Lil J or something like that before that. And he like, I'm Young Jeezy. That was inspired by that. Mm -hmm. And all the other Yeezys, anybody that's an Yeezy rapper, like with the Yeezy on the end, it came from that. So when you are influenced, sometimes you're indirectly influenced. And... You don't even got to know about me or what I did. And it's shit that it's the trickle down. Some shit I did influenced the person that influenced you or influenced the thing that influenced you. Like it, we, we on that level now. For sure. The trickle down is, is in full effect. <laughs> uh, have you seen the Kanye documentary? I have not seen the newest, 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 but I'm in the know of uh, a lot of what might be intriguing about it or what, 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 what are we going to ask me? Oh, well, it's just super inspiring. You mentioned Kanye, so just thought it out. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to get it. My last documentary was, uh, uh, what is it? Let's have a conversation about Bill Cosby. We should have a conversation. Something. That shit was eye-opening. Yeah. I don't think I saw that. Yeah, well, you know, you should see it. Cause <laughs> I feel like um, I feel like Bill Cosby, if any of that shit is, like, is what it is or all the accusations, I don't want to speak on how I feel about it, but... I just feel like if those accusations were accurate, I think that Bill should have just had a little more player game. He should have knew a guy like me or another uh, Bay Area damn. cat and like give him some game like Bill. When you, I don't want to use his name. Oh no, you're good. <laughs> but I'm like, but when you get with the bros, man, you don't gotta give him the whoop whop. Just say this and do that. Yeah, you know. But I don't know. I don't know what the intentions were. I respect that. And I don't that. know how real the what the truth truth is. But I do know I am of that group of people who were offended by what he was saying and doing prior or during these times of these accusations where he was like kind of taking the moral high road on us and degrading us and, and isolating so many black men mm -hmm. and not just things that applied to me, but things that I was like, all right, Bill Cosby shitting on us. Like he, he was explaining what it, what a, a proper, what a black man should be. And at the same time, he wasn't being that. Right. So wow. I'm, I'm, I was offended when it was happening because of the way he was saying it. Right. And and he said it a lot. And then I'm highly offended now because of the story that came around. So, right. But, you know, um, I don't know. We don't know the facts on that. Right. This is, this is supposed to be about the facts. Right. Being a father at 52... <laughs> <laughs> That sounds funny. All right. Did you, like, did you just wrap it up this whole time? Like, how were you so careful? The you question know? is, how were you not a father at the age of 51 and younger? That's the question? Uh, kind of. Well, I just want to know. How does too short get all that pussy and is, not have kids? Yeah. Because, you know, people got So, when I was kids. young, high school, 
I got my girlfriend pregnant. Oh. I was, you know, at the time, I was like, you go through all these emotions. Is it mine? What are we going to do? <laughs> we can't afford a baby. You know, you go through all these emotions and, and like, you want to have a baby? How old and were you? I was 16 and she was oh 17. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And we decided that we probably shouldn't be parents right then. So that child would have been born in 1984. Oh, wow. I would have had damn near a 40-year-old kid, damn near. Could have. All right. Then, after that, later on, I got my, not my next girlfriend, but my later on down the line girlfriend, got pregnant a couple of times. And she had a miscarriage and an abortion. And maybe I got one other person pregnant, maybe. And this all happened before I was like, from the age of 16 until about 27. And the last girlfriend that was like, I'm pregnant, and we talked about it, she said, this is what fucked me up, period, point blank. She said, oh, I don't want to have a baby out of wedlock. I said, I don't want to get married. She's like, well, we, we shouldn't do this. And we did the whole uh, find a place, went to place, got the thing done. Uh, there was, a, um, it was a fucked up the abortion? situation. Yeah. Oh, okay. There was a situation where they had to call me into the room and they was like, she's panicking and she wants you in here. So I went in there and I was looking the other way, but I was holding her hand and I was like, just like, you know, squeezing, holding her hand. And then while it was happening, it was it was a while. It was like a, I can't tell you how long it was, but I peeked over it. And they would just traumatized the fuck out of me at what they were doing and what I saw, which I would never mention oh ever in my, my life. Gosh. And this was like prior, right? It was like the week of my birthday. So we were taking it easy for a few days, just like laying around the house all day. And... It was my birthday, the morning of my birthday. She woke up and she would start crying. And she wouldn't stop crying. And she would, I'm talking like real tears. That shit won't, fucks with you. Won't stop crying. So I'm thinking, you know, you know, trying to console her, you know, just going through motion. And she finally was like, she was like, you know what? I was I don't even have a birthday present for you. And she said, your birthday present was, I was gonna tell you I'm pregnant with your son. And she said, I didn't want to get an abortion. I just wanted you to say that you didn't want me to get an abortion. And you never said it. And that moment in life has, to this day, that moment, it just, it made me, from that point on, if I wasn't strapped up, I was pulling out. If I wasn't pulling out, I was jumping out. I was <laughs> running out. I was like, ain't nobody going to ever come to me and say they're pregnant by me unless I want to have a baby with that person. And, wow. And from that point, I was probably like 27. So I was 52. So half my, double my life after that, I was just was like, it's not going to happen. And for 27 years, no woman came to me and said, I'm pregnant by you. Like I was that motherfucking careful. Like For sure. They say when you pull out, uh, you, you might still like leak a little bit. The pre -com, I right? was No, I was porn star. Uh, uh. I was like, you you got to pull out and you got to help it along a little bit. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not just pulling out when it's coming. I'm pulling out right before it comes. <laughs> like, what you don't style inside? Shit. <laughs> it's going to be a wet spot around here. <laughs> Fuck that. Like, I was serious. I was serious. And it wasn't about making babies. It was, it was about wanting to be a father and never wanting to experience or putting anybody through what I put her through I and how it affected that. me and her. Like, I was responsible after that. I respect that a lot. Like a motherfucker. Right. So that's how I went down. And it was a very traumatizing event. Uh, I wish that I had experienced fatherhood at a younger age because it's different to be a young father than an older father. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. So was this baby intentional? Uh, I let it happen. I did not. I did not do the things that you would do to not, that I had been doing to not make babies. So okay. I felt like I was in good hands, that this was, I can't say it was the time. I just felt like when you, when you hold back from something like that, like you purposely, I'm not making a baby with you. I'm not doing this. You know what you're doing. So I knew what I was doing when I did let it happen. I knew what I was doing and who I was doing it with. And I'm like, I'll do this. Right. And I honestly, I tell you, I was like, I didn't think it would happen. I didn't think these old nuts was making babies. 
Bow. Did you cry? <laughs> um, I just wasn't against it. You know what I mean? I was for it. I was just for it. I'm like, okay, it's cool. I love and it. I can't even say if I was put in that position right now, what I would do in the same position, would I do it again? Or would I, you know, continue the ways of right of resisting fatherhood? Were you in the delivery room? Hmm? Were you in the delivery room? Uh, no, it was a story that I can't tell, but it oh, was, okay. um, I was there right after. Okay. I, and I, I swore that I wouldn't be there for a baby delivery. I'm not doing that. You're the father, though. I'm not going in there to stare at the baby being born. I'm not doing it. I'm just not. I didn't, you know, <laughs> I can admit right now that <laughs> I have changed diapers. <laughs> I did not change a diaper fuck, to probably like, it was well over a year into it. Okay. And the t first time I changed a diaper, it was like, it was like, um, <laughs> it was like an emergency. <laughs> it was like, I was with her by myself. Oh, and shit. Then, and I'm like, it's supposed to, just supposed to be like a quick run and come back. And I'm like, yo, she peed. What do I do? <laughs> okay, I'm going to FaceTime you. All right, then you do like this. Hey, I've been watching, but I still needed like yeah. the play-by-play play on how to, like it's a girl and I'm like, I'm like opening it like I'm defusing an atomic bomb or something, what do I do? <laughs> but I, I got, you know, if the love makes you do it. At the time I wouldn't touch a diaper. I was, I was talking to, to like homies who had like three kids. They're like, man, man I roll a blunt and change a diaper at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's I, hilarious. I can't relate, but you know, daddy duty. Like I, I'm, I'm proud of my uh, evolution as a as a man. I think uh, I think it happened to me at a good time in life because I honestly believe I love that, that. It, it wouldn't have been you wouldn't have got this version of me in my twenties or thirties. Totally. You know. How old is she now? She's three. Oh, okay. I have a three year old daughter who is now becoming very verbal. My man right here, he got a daughter. Aww. Your daughter just hit, what, seven, eight? Oh, she ten, turned 10. Damn. And then I met her, she's like three or four, right? And I know what I'm, I know where it's going. I'm watching him and my other homies. And, you know, Scarface called me on the phone one day on FaceTime. Brother and uh, his daughter was like barking on him about something. It wasn't like, like being mean, but she was just like, you know, doing the dad, like daddy. Like, and then uh, he sent me a video. <laughs> he was, he just be like warning me like just showing you your future. <laughs> I'm done. And cause daughters be on their daddies. They be on them. Right. On them. So you know. Can you bring us back to when you made uh real N words with Jay Z? Can I bring us back to when we made it? Um so back then I had uh, announced my retirement. That was Oh, I wanted to touch on that too. Why did you want to retire? So my tenth album I turned 30, and 30, 30 was an old-ass age for a rapper in 1996. It was a thing, old-ass 30-year-old rapper. That was a thing. Like, it's nothing now. Yeah. That was a thing. So, I think it's still people like... So I was 30, and it was my 10th album. And I'm always, like, into this numbers and shit, and I was like, right. it just sounds like a moment, a stat. So I was like, this is going to be my last album. Everything was going platinum, and you're thinking, like, you win the Super Bowl or you retire. So I'm like, I'm a platinum and retire. And I announced the retirement and everything just got like the demand just was like woof. So the offer for not retiring was hella money. The fucking everybody like New York wasn't fucking with me. I had all the platinums, go look at the sound scans. It'd be like everywhere in America, you know, off outside of the East Coast would add up to like 1.2 million sales, sound scans. And then you look at the state of New York and the whole fucking entire state would be like 1,200 sales. And the whole East Coast, each city would be like 300, 200. Like it's like somebody was buying it, but then they, I don't know if they was returning it or just only like one person on the block liked it. I don't know. You know what Biggie told me? Big said, um, you got love in Brooklyn. So I don't know how much of Brooklyn like too short. But I like to think that when I seen the New York sound scans and it said 1200, I like to think that all 1200 was sold in Brooklyn. That's, that's my fantasy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause they like, they, they, they told me 
back then, the reason why Jay-Z would do a song with Too Short or Pimp C was because Cats in Brooklyn was like not really, you know, they just wasn't really like, I ain't fucking with nobody outside of New York. Like motherfuckers in New York was like, if you ain't from New York, I don't even wanna fucking hear it. Right. I don't give a fuck what you said, dude. You, if you're not from New York, you're not a real rapper. That was just it. It was not bending. A lot of people was just like, it's watered down, it's fake, because you're not from one of the five boroughs. That's hands down, that gave birth to a lot of shit. A lot of, you know, what you might call East West, whatever. It was just an attitude. Mm-hmm. I used to do rap, I used to do shows with New York artists. Mm-hmm. And we'd be backstage and just just walk right by each other. Don't even make eye contact, don't look, don't speak. And it was just like, it was just like that. That's how it was. It, was, it, was, it wasn't really uh, the hip hop we know today. But Jigga, Big, they, you could listen to the music and you could tell that Jay-Z was in tune with Scarface. He was in tune with Too Short and N.W.A. He wasn't like, he wasn't like necessarily liking that better than New York rapping them, but he was just in tune with it. You could tell that he was, you know, open to the sound of a slower, funkier beat with a bass line with a certain little drum pattern, like, you know, and put that New York in it and, 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 and make it is make it what it is, but you know, um, Jay Z called on me a few times. He did the remix to "Blow the Whistle." We did the um, that song. It was all good just a week ago. That was oh, yeah. like I came in the studio that day. He called me said I need you for something. And he just wanted my voice to say those parts. I didn't write that shit. He told me what to say, and it's it's a classic. Like it was all good just a week ago. Right, and you know. Uh, Jay-Z is one of them persons, one of those matter-of-fact people. When you, it's just a matter-of-fact, you know, like, this is what we doing, do this. For so, sure. You know, we did a few songs. Yeah. The first song we did was uh, Real Niggas Do Real Things. Yeah. That was the first one we did. Because I, I don't, because in the Kanye documentary, uh, it shows Kanye, how Kanye got on Jay-Z's album Blueprint, mm-hmm. Blueprint 2 or whatever. And as it a was, producer? Huh? As a no, producer? as the feature. They had the song okay. together, but... It's funny because in the studio session, it shows Jay-Z literally being like, yo, closed mouths don't get fed because Kanye literally, you know, mm-hmm. put it in front of him. That's right, because Kanye was around as a producer before, right? Right. It's, and they, they was fucking with him, but nobody didn't give a fuck about his raps. Right. And he, That's wild. He had to speak up shit. Right. Sp- speak up. Because you do, you produce too, right? I make beats. I've made a lot of beats over the years. I'm not making beats anymore. Okay. I made my share of beats. I remember Scarface called me. He was in New York. He was like, I got the coldest motherfucking producer. And you know what I told him? He was talking about Kanye West. You know what I told him? I said, man, we got all the, I was in Atlanta. I was like, we got all the producers with me. I don't need, I don't need no new producers. And he was like, I swear to God, if I can't remember the number and I don't want to disrespect Kanye, but I swear he said, he's the coldest motherfucker in the world. He out here in New York, he from Chicago. He told me his name, everything he said. Two thousand dollars a beat. He said it's the boy beats. He's like it's the shit. And I was like, man, we got producers. Uh-uh. This was this. Uh, Scarface did um, my block with Kanye, mm-hmm. and he did another one. I can't think of what it was. It was um, early on. Like he did the, the two came out of whatever project he dropped. He was fucking with Def Jam back then, mm-hmm. and Kanye wasn't really like. He had, he was just about to do, you know, it was that Scarface song, the early songs with Jay. He was just doing all that as a producer. Mm-hmm. And Face was calling me, talking about, bro, I got to do with some dope ass beats. I didn't even listen to him. Oh, wow. That's, that's, I did some dumb shit in my life, but that was one of the. That's wild. That's up on the top of the list. Yeah. <laughs> dumb shit. Uh, turning down young Kanye beats when he, before the price went up and before. Oh, wow. What made you just, do you do, I mean. I'm a music guy. I, right. I, I live around music guys. We didn't need no fucking beats, but damn, if I would have knew. Damn, that's wild. I didn't have no damn psychic around me or right. crystal ball. I didn't know. Right. You know? Yeah. I didn't know. That's crazy. Um, speaking of music, you did Big Sexy Thing with Lil Duval. That's new. That's how, the newest newest. How was that? Well, I wanted to do a song that was fun and funny and kind of, you know, fun, funny for the family and maybe like, could be a song that, you know, that got that wedding um, reception vibe, you know, just the vibe. Yeah. Old disco remake, 
disco record from back in the day. And a lot of artists, I had the song on file, shit, for way more than 10 years. I wouldn't say 15, but it was way more than 10 years. I had that song in my little repertoire of really? songs that could be made. It had the, it was, the instrumental was looped mm -hmm. and it had the hook on it. Mm -hmm. that I looped the hook from the actual song. And it was just something that I always had. And I played for people and they'd be like, nah, 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 nah. Damn. I remember playing it for Snoop, all kind of motherfuckers. Like, they just wasn't really feeling that moment in time. And then I, um, I had my boy Prozac, who does a lot of stuff for E40. He did, he did some of the, um, he did some songs about Westmore. Mm -hmm. You know, Prozac. He, he, he's a really good at remaking a song and bringing that exact element of the song, what it really is and always was. Mm -hmm. Instead of remaking it, this whole new. He could, he keeps the essence of the song, and he can like, I don't know how he does it, but he can mimic like voices, hooks. He get the, all the sounds right, guitar, everything. So uh, he was the guy for the job. I was like, Prozac, man, do this one for me. And he came back with it, and he had the hook, I believe in miracles. <laughs> and it was cool. But I was like, I need, like, somebody. Yeah. Like, somebody. Because it's a funny song, and I need somebody funny to get on it. And right. like, where you going to get Eddie Murphy? Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny, but right. where you going to get Eddie Murphy? Like, right. Like, who could fit the criteria? And hands down, it was like Duvall was the guy. But I didn't know. I knew he would do it and would sing on but I didn't know he could really sing. <laughs> Like, he really can sing. His song was Snoop's I, I told him to his face. I said, bro, you can really sing. He said, nah, bro, I'm just a comedian. I, you know, I could, I, he's like, I can, what do you say? What's that? Impersonate. Oh, okay. But it sounded good to me on the song. As a singer, taking right. away the fact that it's Duval and he hella funny and all this shit. He, he sounded good on the song. Check I just, it out. Big Sexy. I just can't with the fact that he has a song say, that says, Black Man Don't Cheat. Like, what is that? Black Man what? He has a song Black that Man says, Don't Cheat? yeah. That's the name of the song, or that's in the song? That's the name of the song. I'm pretty sure. Sounds like sarcasm to me. Right? What is your take on cheating, Too Short? <laughs> uh, it's only cheating if you don't tell the truth. Mm. You know? Yeah, he has a song called Black Men Don't Cheat. So when I was young, and I was, a, you know, the pullout king, I had a, a couple of safety nets. My main safety net was on the day that I meet you and the first time we ever talk, most people that meet and they like got a little flirt thing going, they like, you single? Who you with? You know? <laughs> and they'd be like, are you single? And I'm like, not really. I do have somebody I'm involved with, but they don't live in this city. They live out of town. Mm -hmm. And that was just a safety net. It wasn't a true story. I would just say that to every woman I meet and flirt with just as a safety net of what if you got deeply involved with her and then she saw you with somebody else or she found out something about somebody else? You could always go back to the safety net and say, damn, when I first met you, I told you I was involved with somebody that lived out of town. Right. That was just a, so when you see me with the other person, she might be local, she might be my girlfriend before you, but that was my safety net. I, I planted that seed early in the conversation, in the friendship, just so that I always have an exit door of co confrontation. I'm I'm very non-confrontational mm -hmm. and I'm just like, if you yell at me and go, are hey, you cheating? You cheating? I just go, I'm gonna call you, let's talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> and I just like retreat <laughs> instead of going, yeah, motherfucker, well, well. I just, it's, I'm just always been like, it is what it is. Cause I'm kind of, I'm kind of scary in relationships. I'm not really- um, You're scary? You know, I'm not really like gonna go down that journey with you of let's fucking deal with everything. I'm really I'm 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 telling you all this stuff as a young short dog. For sure. This is I didn't mature till I was forty years old. I was a little ass boy until I was forty. I was handling my business, but I was mature as fuck when it came to relationships, and I was immature as fuck when it came to relationships and and just dealing with them. I just I just was a kid. I'm like on to the next, or I, you hella serious coming at me with tears, and I'm fucking laughing, talking like, man, you tripping, man. <laughs> Why you tripping? I wasn't with her last night, man. Like that, I was that guy. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Um, real quick, I know you're big on supporting female rappers, which I really respect. Mm -hmm. How was it getting on Khaleesi's bossy? That was a moment um, in time. Uh, you got a lot of moments. I think Khaleesi requested me on that song. If she didn't request me, it would have something to do with Neptune's production, 
their affiliation with Jive Records, who could be the person for the feature on this song. You know, it could have went to that route or it could have been she requested me. But it was always a good experience that I was picked for that song. I remember I did the verse, my verse in Atlanta. They had already sent me the song, it was recorded. And I tried to go hard, but it was like a gray area, like R&B artists and rappers, especially like female R&B artists. It was very, you know, it, was, it wasn't like, be, the line wasn't being all the way crossed a lot. Mm -hmm. So I tried to approach it in the sense where I'm still too short, but I'm not disrespecting the female artists. And boss bitch was perfect. I was the perfect person for the song. I'm a boss bitch. And I'm complimenting you as a boss bitch. It was, it was dope. And the fact that they shot the video and it was a hit. And, you know, it wasn't my record, but those hits, they, they extend your career. They just do. So that was one of my later songs that, that kind of, you know, I wasn't on the platinum, 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 platinum run, but the legacy was holding me down, you know, where people were like, I need you for a feature, this and that. So right. outside of my, you know, outside of my six, possibly seven platinum albums, I appeared, I guest appeared on like, I don't even, Wait, I can't. Can I read this fact? <laughs> Too Short was a guest feature on 20 to 30 gold and platinum albums, two Jay-Z albums, two Notorious Big albums, as well as several other prominent artists. Too many to count. Too many. So it's too many to count because I don't know how many I did. Mm -hmm. I could walk you around here and show you the plaques that people sent me. I got G-Eazy plaques, Lil oh, John hey. plaques, um, Jay-Z yeah. plaques. Shout out to Trey the Truth with the bump, bump box. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Trey the Truth, no doubt. <laughs> Brought that here personally. Oh, that was before everybody got the customized one. That's why mine Damn. is playing. Damn, you all got songs, huh? You and Trey have the truth. Me and Trey have songs. Yes, we do. We do. Go look him up. He's one of the real ones. For yeah, sure. I mean, real dude. For sure. When you on his soil and we come on your soil, like I, nothing bad. I don't think I've never heard nobody say nothing bad about him. For sure. So, wait, sorry. Before we go on, mm -hmm. how do you feel about his situation with his daughter? That's the saddest thing. I don't know what happened. Oh, he's trying to get custody of his daughter and his baby mom is just tripping. And he's like the- The he, daughter it, he took a million pictures of and posted? The the daughter that he dedicates his she's life to. She's probably like a little bit older than my daughter. How old is she? Oh, I'm not sure. But I just know it's he's- gotta be, My daughter's three, so she's gotta be like four or yeah. either- Yeah, but he's been going through it. Or either the same age. Yeah, he's been going through it. Um, I think you gotta fight. I think um, whether it's something you're fighting for or something you fighting against, like a divorce or something. Like you gotta fight, you gotta right. fight. Like it's a fight, like it really is. These relationships and this long-term shit, like let's say, and I don't wanna get in this business, but let's say hypothetically that whatever happens is gonna prevent him from ever seeing his daughter. Like she lead a country or just just shut him down. He never sees her. The fight, the public fight, the, the things that you put on record that I was fighting, it's gonna mean something to that that child later on in life. Mm -hmm. She's gonna like she's gonna be told your daddy abandoned us or your daddy ain't here, but then she's gonna look and find out for herself. My daddy publicly said out there over and over again that he was fighting for me. Like that means something, right? Like people grow up, parents manipulate kids. Kids grow up, find out their own truth. Our parents are some lying motherfuckers. <laughs> Grandparents, they don't tell you shit. That's right. the truth. They tell you what they think is going to be best for your little comfort zone. They be lying like a motherfucker. For sure. The trauma that they go through, the, the triumphs that they overcome, the little secrets in their closets, they don't tell us shit. Right. And probably when we grow up, like I'm grown, you grown. I know hella secrets about people like, like, like kids. I know shit about your mom and daddy that I would never tell you. Like, and you know, it's not fair, but- right. That's how it fucking is. Right. Just fucking like that. Like, I know your mama used to fuck him before she met your daddy. Damn. I know that. Right. And then we all sitting at the table. Fam we have friends and family, but your mama switched boyfriends. Right. <laughs> I, know the, I know the truth. But back to the plaques. Continue on the plaques. Sorry. I got plaques from fucking Jay-Z, fucking Foxy Brown, fucking Ooh. all kind of movies and shit. Fucking Snoop Doggy Dog E Forty, it's plaques. I have, I don't even like my plaque life became complicated. <laughs> like I don't think I have enough organization to have actually held on to every plaque and to keep every plaque cherished and 
and mounted on a wall because I've moved studios and all kind of shit. I don't know for a fact it's like 80 plaques somewhere. I don't know if they fucking in one of these goddamn storages. I don't yeah. know. And I, whatever, you can say it. Whatever. When you get to this stage, you know what I do with plaques? I decorate them. Like the, the color of what the album were, how they made it goes in a color coordinated room. So if you go in that studio and you see five, six plaques on the wall, those are the plaques that match the aura of the room. They're not the plaques I wanted to put in the room. They're the ones that match the decor. You know, I mean, motherfuckers, you know, that can decorate their rooms with the plaques that actually fit into the color scheme of the room. You know what I mean? There's a lot of shit that I, I really wanted to do this because I be doing, I know how Vlad be doing all the little segments and little sound bites. <laughs> so I really wanted to do this to talk a lot of shit and it just, I don't want you to look at me and go, damn, short sure you did that. I want you to look at me and say, I'm about to outdo you. I'm about to fucking have more no fucking shit than Too Short did. I love that. I'm about to rap till I'm older than Too Short did. I, I want you to fucking like see that this is possible. I like, love I'm, that. I just did a whole fucking weekend of shows this weekend. Right. I just did three fucking shows, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sold out fucking arenas, ripping that shit. I I'm 55 that. fucking years old. I respect that. That's hip hop. Right. You mentioned Rock and roll. That's fucking all that shit. Facts. You mentioned Foxy Brown. Nicki Minaj just did an interview with Joe Budden who said Foxy was like one of her biggest influences. So how was that mm -hmm. working with fucking Foxy Brown? So part of the story I was telling a little earlier that I didn't really tell the gist of it was that when I announced my retirement, it opened up this door and uh, uh, with me and, East me and the East Coast. And at the same time I was retiring in 1996, I had a really good friendship going with Eric Sermon, mm. Redman, Keith Murray, mm. the Def Squad. They had a setup in Atlanta, and we were all mutual friends that were based at this rim shop, uh, this tire and wheel shop on Ralph McGill and Peachtree downtown, heart of downtown Atlanta. And the rim shop was famous at a studio, and it was just a lot of rappers frequented there. Uh, Mr. Cheeks from from uh, the Lost Boys would always be there. Red Man, Keith Murray, Eric Sermon was always there. I was always there. Fucking Tupac always pulling up. It was a lot of names that I could name you that frequented the rim shop. Yeah. So um, I, I, did, I had a really personal friendship with Eric Sermon, Red Man, and Keith Murray and all they homies. Like I had, a, they was, we, we was family. We move around together, do all kinds of shit. Keith Murray is my guy. Like, Outside of even Red Man and Eric Sermon, me and Keith, like Keith took me through some New York shit and we like, we rolled around. Like we don't need fucking security and we don't need other people. We just roll like that. He was my, he was a guy like me. Right. Like I hung out with Keith Murray one day and all day we hanging out. Just chopping up, doing shit. We go to the tunnel in New York. He took me to the tunnel. I don't even know if it was me and him and like one or two other people, but it wasn't no whole crew. It was just me. And the tunnel was savage. Savage. Once you go inside, it's the roughest niggas in New York and it ain't nobody going to save you. Right. And New York is rough. <laughs> like, ah, man, I don't give a fuck how savvy you are. If New York want to eat you, you're eating. Like, it's rough. And keep Murray. He ain't no big old dude, but we just out there. We go through all this shit. We get to the tunnel. It's the most extensive search that you've ever seen in your life. They taking your belt and doing like this with your belt, looking for any fucking little sharp thing you might have. You got to stick out your tongue up and down. Ah, they looking behind your ear. They running through your hat. I ain't never seen a search like that. <laughs> we get inside the tunnel. We've been hanging all day, smoking, laughing, kicking it. You know what Keith Murray does? What? Spits out a razor blade. It's been in the side of his mouth all day. Like, you know, the little razor blades, you know, the ones that come in a little pack and you push them out? Mm -hmm. All day. That's I, wild. I don't know how, I've asked every New Yorker that I ever <laughs> knew, how do you learn that? What is the learning curve of the razor blade in your mouth? <laughs> That's wild. Like, once you get it there and you know the technique on how to keep it and not cut your whole face open on the inside, but what is the learning curve? That's wild. Where did the first day you just throw the razor, you throw it in your mouth? You know, <laughs> learning must be painful. Right. But hey, Keith Murray was a real one. He was a real <laughs> That's my guy. So I retire, and then all of the phone starts ringing. I get a song. I did a song. I did a song with Little Kim called Call Me. Mm. That was on the Booty Call movie soundtrack 
orchestrated by Jive Records. Biggie called me for the song, and I did um, the first one with him, which was um, The World Is Filled. Jay-Z called me for the song. The first one I did with him was Real Niggas Do Real Things. Um, I did the music with Eric Sermon. I'm going to give all credit to Eric Sermon because we was fucking around the studio, just hanging out as homies, and we did a song called Buy You Some. And it comes on, it's like, real live drummer. Homie Shorty B on the drums and Shorty B on the bass. He like, woo. That's Eric Sermon voice. Ha ha, I, I, I. That became like a chant in New York clubs, Atlanta clubs, everywhere. It was hot. The record was regional. I don't know all where it hit, but it was big in New York and it was big in motherfucking Atlanta. Buy you some. Crazy. And me and Eric Sermon through that song, we sort of became a, a little lightweight dynamic duo. And we followed up with a few other songs, but we had a little moment where we was we had this thing. Like that was one of the hottest records in Atlanta when it was out. Like just at the at the sound of this, the song comes on. DJ, he got the fucking snare. It's like the um the snare drum. So the DJ always playing with okay, okay. you can hear it's that snare. You know, when it, if you a person who know music. And the DJ is lining up a song and he, uh, 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 whatever it is, you're like, oh, he about to drop that shit if you know music. So that, uh, 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 uh. And then the crowd always know. They go, whoo, ha, ha, ah. It was just one of them things. We had, we had it that moment. And Eric Sermon made me famous in New York. Wow. Like literally my little Jay-Z moment, my little big moment, my little Kim moment. Then was all like, you know, building blocks. But that song, it made, I had, I probably was on, I probably had all, of, all five or six platinums at that point. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, New York is like, we fuck with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I give credit to Eric Sermon. And, you know, when I retired, that opened up the floodgates to all the New York collabs I did. And it was, it was just kind of feeling, I could be wrong, but it was like, if Two Shorts gonna retire, and you know the um the 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 rumor at the time was Too Short had I was album number 10. They're like, Too Short got 10 albums and they all went platinum. So he 10 albums, 10 platinum. That was the rumor. It wasn't all the way true. It was like four goals, six platinum. Mm -hmm. But they were still, the rumor was big. I loved it <laughs> at the time. I, I would never dispute it. Right. Ten, they got 10 platinums. Right. <laughs> so everybody wanted to get a little piece of Too Short, like a 16 bar before I dipped out. And I did a lot of features, Damn. a lot of fucking features. And then after that, after that little hype died down, I was just like a go-to guy. Like it was like, like, and I did something that I don't think most rappers did. I don't think many rappers did this at all. So I did all these features with all these artists signing major labels that had huge fan bases. But at the same time, so you on a major label, I might charge you and, and you can laugh at the numbers, but this is what it was. I might charge you 15, 20, 25,000 to get a 16 bar verse. It'd be like anywhere up to about 40, 50, depending on what the project was to get a 16 bar verse. But at the same time, I don't care where we was at. I'm doing a show. The show ends at could be midnight, could be two in the morning. I'm like, my flight leaves at seven. If you come up with 10 G's, it could be any number. I like 10 G's. Motherfucker call back and say, we got seven. Where y'all at? I'm going to go over there and give you 16 bars with seven G's. Motherfucker might say, we got five and I don't know, some. It could be whatever. Five was like, you got to be my cousin's cousin. You got to be like, I got to be fucking your sister. Like, it's got to be something that will make me do it. The five was like the minimum. But to get the five, you had to be some, like my cousin. Somebody that I fuck with had to vouch for you. <laughs> And I'm like, bro, you know I don't do this five shit. You vouching for this motherfucker? And then if I had this thing too, if I do the five for you, because I'm like in any random city in America, if I do the five for you, I'm like, you can never in life, you that asked me to do this for that little minimum way, you can never ask me for another favor ever again. Damn, this is your like one that? favor. Yeah, like you exhausted your one favor. You, you're not <laughs> shooting me the 10 or the 75 or nothing, the 15. Like we did every number in the, in the middle, but it's like, we would clean up. Like some nights I would do two, I would hit two studios and do two verses. I would lead a show. And I, I'm tuned in with all the little hood niggas and the shit. And I'm like, bro, I'm out here, bro. You got any little rappers you know? 
Anybody, any ballers with a rap artist that want to grab a two short verse? Like, it's, it's the fire sale after a show. Like, if you call me and I'm at the house, that number, like 15, 20, 25 is up there. But if you fucking, right now, just go off stage. I left so many verses all over the country. Wow. Hundreds. Like, literally just, and it wasn't for the money. It was for, this is the logic. So look at this. If I do a verse for, I'm in your city. I pick a city, St. Louis, tough ass city. So I do a show in St. Louis. And then the little homie from the hood, him and his folks call me to come do a song with them, right? Now I go over to where they're at. I pull up in there. It's me and my homies. That's points right there. They're like, damn, they pulled up in our hood. Too short here. You know, that's, that's love. Then I give them the dope ass verse. We powwow, we smoke. You know what I'm saying? Somebody got somebody's number, we in touch. If they ever come to the West, they, they tap into us. We like, bro, you hear all the, like that locked in friendship is marketing out of this world. Mm. Cause that song may never go nationwide, but you know where it is gonna go? It's gonna go hood wide. You feel what I'm saying? It's gonna go that side of town wide. Right. And that thing right there, man, you don't know how to trinkle down to that is amazing. Man, you did a song with my cousin. I'm from St. Louis. You did a song with my, my, my ex-girlfriend's little brother. This shit just goes forever. Can we talk about you working with Kid Cudi on Girls real quick? Kid Cudi. That was a very interesting occurrence. Let me see if I can recall this properly. Because I, I have like this blurry vision of what took place. Um, I don't know how the idea was born. I'm sure... The homie Scott was in the lab. The son was a uh, pretty girls. And he was like, damn, you know, he's, he's a very dope rapper. So I think in his dopeness of the understanding of all MCs, you know, certain rappers like him, Lupe, they kind of, there's a lot of them out there. They kind of could dissect all MCs because they're such really good MCs. They're not just good MCs on delivery. They're really good songwriters. So they can dissect all the rest of us and, 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 uh, you know, figure out the value of us as rappers. And I think guys like that understand Too Short. Mm -hmm. They they can listen to the genius in the simplicity of my flow and how I write songs and understand the impact of why I am multi multi-platinum multiple times. They get it. So you like, damn, a kid, Cuddy? Why, why would a Lupe Fiasco do a song with Too Short? He ain't Too Short don't compare to them bar for bar. I did songs with Nas, everybody. So it's like, if you understand the genius of it as an MC, as a songwriter, then you get it. So I figured that's probably why he tapped into me for that song, because he knew that the approach I was going to take to it was going to complete the song to what he wanted it to be. And I got to send a shout out to um, Scott Muscutty, Kid Cuddy. For sure. Because um, a lot of his fans, I mean, people that would... They tell me to my fucking face, they're like, man, I don't even really know your music, but the one song you did with <laughs> Kid Cudi, it's like, that's the shit. Like, a lot of his fans actually verbally come to me and say, I appreciate what you did on that song. Right. They're like, man, I ain't even know nothing about you to that song. Like, that's big for me. For sure. And he opened the door, like, it was a younger, it was a younger fan base too, which was dope. I, you know, I got to say thank you for that, because a lot of... A lot of collaborations I do, I don't get that kind of feedback. I don't get multiple fans, the dude at the at the Foot Locker selling me the shoe going, are you too short? Oh, that was dope, that song you did with Kid Cudi. Like, I don't get that, like, specifically for a certain artist. Right. But his fan base has can, has thanked me multiple times. So that's, that's, that's special to a guy like me because I've done so many collabs. And um, I'll tell you another collaboration story that, that has a positive tone. Notorious Big had recently been murdered. And, you know, Tupac was murdered six months earlier. And then the shit happened with Biggie. And the big funeral, you know, Brooklyn, you know, that, what the shit, the magnitude of what that was. So I'm in Atlanta at a club. And it's the club's called Atlanta Live. And in that club, there was a, a VIP section upstairs. In that VIP section, it had a private staircase that kind of went down, sort of like down. Mm -hmm. And to get 
To go down from the VIP was cool, but to get through it from the bottom, you had to be like somebody, some kind of way to get through the guy at the bottom to get up to it. Mm -hmm. So I think I was going up and this dude was coming down. And it's kind of like nightclub vibe, kind of dark. And at this moment, there ain't nobody on the staircase. I'm always floating through the club by myself, whatever. That's my style. Ain't nobody in this goddamn little hallway staircase except me and this dude. And he stopped me. And he's like, are you too short? I'm like, yeah. He was like, yeah, respect. He was like, I'm from New York. I'm from Brooklyn. And he was like, he said, <laughs> this is what he said. He said, man, he, was, he, was, he just had to tell me this. He said, man, if anybody says the word California to me tonight, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. Oh, wow. Like Biggie had just been buried. He said, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. If, he, if they say the word California, he said, but you, he said, um, he said, um, I don't know if he said Big or Jay-Z, but I think he said Big. He said, my man Big always spoke highly of you. And I just, you know, respect, love, and all that shit. And it was just the craziest shit because in his face was not a person talking shit. It was a person that literally was going to kill somebody if they said the word Cal Like, it was Big It just got buried. He was seriously like, I will fucking murder you if I hear the word California. And... That's the love, that love, that family love. My whole theme of this whole thing is I'm family. I'm your family member by default, some kind of way. And it always comes back to that, to the, the, the way I walk through life. It always comes back to that fucking family vibe. Like, like literally, like I've been in a situation where it wasn't favoring me. And motherfuckers was just kind of sizing me up on what, for whatever, whatever reason. And whether I knew it or not, and I sensed it or not, somebody that I didn't know rode over to me and said, I'm in, I'm in who knows the fuck where on earth. And somebody rose up to me and said, yo, I know what's going down. Boy, oh boy, and them over there, you know, I see it. It's like, well, one time you did a song with my uncle. My uncle just bumped you all the time. My uncle said you was his homie. He's like, look over there. That's my crew. You good up in here. Wow. And I'm sitting in the middle of some shit like some motherfuckers looking at me. I'm doing the usual me. Might be gambling on the pool table or just somewhere. And niggas like, oh, he think he loose like that? Here, watch this. And the other guys come and say, they ain't finna fuck with you. Dudes, I don't even know. And it comes from the path I walk through life. And they saying, we got you like this because our folks said you was, that, you was the homie. I got a lot of that out there. Like right. next generation. Little niggas. Little niggas like, man, you was my uncle. They, they say who uncle was. I'm like, that's my guy. They're like, uncle, you good in here. Don't worry about, don't even worry about them. We finna go over there and let them know right now. And I just do my thing. Right. And that's, that's, that's the too short love. It's, it's different. For it's sure. It's really different. For sure. Man, well, you know, I know we covered a lot. What are you most excited for? I know you got sure too short dropping this year. And Mount Westmore. And, well, was, and Westmore. I'm most excited for hip hop. I'm most excited that my point will get across that it ain't about me. It ain't about me. It ain't about what I achieved, and it's not about what I'm going to do after today. It's about what hip-hop can do. This is real. Like, what can you do? I know you looking at the age of 20, at the age of 16. I know you looking like, fuck them old niggas. Like, fuck them OGs, man. They already had their time. Move out the way, OG. I know you looking like that. And I know a lot of stupid-ass OGs is looking like, man, you little young youngsters, man. Y'all don't know how we we did it better, man. Y'all youngsters, man, shit ain't shit. I know it's I know the fucking friction, but I also know that as a youngster, you would love to have my future. Mm -hmm. You would love to know that. Yeah, you in the moment right now, you the hottest shit. Yeah, you gonna get a run in, but you would love to know that your run was gonna last 20, 25, 30, 35 fucking years. You still on the run? Right. What? You would love to know that that was available for you. And I'm letting you know it is. Secondly, OGs oh with the jealous shit, with the hatred. You know what I mean? Man, that shit ain't nothing but pure hate for you to just size up a little nigga that's getting money, that has a fan base, and they love it. He's doing something right in his time. How can you hate that? You listen to the words, and you comparing the laws of gravity and universe and science to what happened 
at a time period of 1980 to 1990 something, and you taking those laws and saying these laws apply to hip hop, hip hop changed, bro. That shit don't fit this shit. It's a new, it's a new hip hop. That's the, that's a vibe. It ain't even a fucking flow. It's just a vibe. And that shit is hot. You can't fucking deny the fact of how they evolved it to get money. They didn't evolve it for personal reasons. They evolved it to the fucking fan. The fan is like, I want to listen to hip hop and feel good. So the fact that hip hop is a, is in the process of a global takeover. Our generation was part of the guys before me, the guys with me, the guys right after me brought that shit to the forefront. The guys now are giving the world satisfaction. You feel me? Like, I know we all been global, but right now they took it. Right. And you know how they took it? They didn't take it on complicated rhyme patterns and motherfucking uh, punchlines and and all this specific shit, too short comedy, a pimp and a gangster. They just took it on the vibe. It feels better. And you know what else is winning? That fucking Spanish shit. Mm, it feels yes. good. People all over the fucking planet speak Spanish. The music feels fucking good. It's winning. Fact. Where's rock and roll right now? I ain't knocking rock. I love rock, but where the fuck is it at? <laughs> Where's the new rock? Machine Gun Kelly. <laughs> That's hip hop. Right. Where's the new rock? And I'm not saying, I'm not I'm just saying, where I'm asking. I don't have the answer. This is, a, this is about facts. Fact. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop is the new motherfucking rock. That's what. Right. Hip hop artists are the new rock and roll stars. Look at them. The fuck? So the generational hate is something I'm against. Right. I call it generational hate. It's within the hip hop community and I don't tolerate it. I don't let the OGs bad mouth the youngsters around me and I don't let no youngsters bad mouth the OGs. If I hear that angle coming from you, I'm like, you're misinformed. And let me just tell you, if y'all want to make the most of it, if you have the opportunity, youngster, work with an OG. OG, work with a youngster. Get in the studio. Both of y'all got a mindset. Uh, give in a little bit, OG. Let the little homies pull you on a, a young sound a little right now shit. Give in, little homie. Let the OG uh, show you how to make a classic song with a classic vibe. Listen to them and see what they sound like. I don't know. Right. One might work. One might not. They both might not work. They both might work. I don't know, but... To just what's going to happen in that session when y'all start bringing up the mind power and the vision and the knowledge, it's going to bridge hip hop over and over again. The bridge ain't that motherfucking long. It's not. Like we, us OGs, we was y'all youngsters. We was y'all the same way. Right. Same shit, the same way we push up in the room, same way we promote the hip hop, the same way they fucking call us the bad. We was the same shit. We was the bad guys. So, you know. It's ours. It's our genre. I'm just saying all this to say that the youngsters are doing it right. They are, they are carrying this shit bigger and further than it ever went. Uh, whether it's streams, downloads, actual fucking sound scan sales, whatever the fuck it is, it's hip hop, period. So that, we can leave it at that. Well, does that mean you got no plans of retiring? Uh, I'm going to retire every fucking two weeks. Who can, I don't know <laughs> shit. Right. Retire? I, just, I don't know. I, I can retire right now and I still have 50 recorded, unreleased songs. Facts. That's what Trey the Truth was saying. He said he got enough out? music to last his. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I can. Man, I, I'm going to pull a new song out at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a special song for my funeral and say, play this first time heard. <laughs> <laughs> I just started that, by the way. I love it. And y'all can, can use that idea too. <laughs> Your own customized funeral song. Yeah. And if, if that bitch here, tell it, kick that bitch out the. The church. <laughs> I'm, I'm just dead. joking. <laughs> I'm dead. Man, well, thank you. You know, we always got your support here. Mm -hmm. You're a legend. You, you went through a lot of facts. You did. I did. I didn't go through the list, but you know. We adapt. We adapt.